What is up, Living Soil Nerds? Happy Wednesday to you. Uh, Marco and I feel like we're coming back with hit after hit with some of our guests here. Uh, you guys are learning about some of the smaller time breeders, some of the big time breeders, you know, the guys that we still find that are not only are they big time, but they're humble and they're, they're willing to come on our little show and, and talk to you guys and try to understand things from a seeds aspect, from lighting aspect. I mean, this whole year we've kind of tried to tackle topics as best we can. Uh, with, with the Rolodex that we have. And from an IO, IMO standpoint, uh, I use that word Michelin chef for a reason. I mean, there are certain people around this country that stand out in the restaurant world. And there are certain people in this country that stand out in the IMO world. Marco, the co-host each and every week, obviously stands out. And there's somebody else that, in our opinion, is in out his own thing, making his own waves. You know, that's the best part about this is you kind of like get down some of the basics some of them uh, people are, are hard-lined uh, about. And then there's other ways to do this where some people have found success maybe, you know, kind of playing around with these things and maybe not necessarily being uh, like rice-based thought process or Korean-based thought process. Uh, and that's something I like about uh, our guest today, OK Calix, Kevin. Uh, the man's in, obviously in Oklahoma. He's doing things a little bit differently, obviously, than even Marco's doing. So there's environments that matter, where you guys are at, the microbial level, where you are. I mean, all of these kind of things come into play, and it all sounds overwhelming when you first get into this. So that's kind of why, um, especially these last few weeks, people have continuing to ask, uh, can we go over IMOs one through five? How do I kind of build on that progression? And we wanted to kind of kick off this. I wanted to throw it over uh, to Marco. While, uh, Kevin, if you could get your little uh, IMO porn that you were showing us beforehand, uh, throw it over to Marco, and then we can kind of show you guys what is possible and, and what you guys can achieve uh, when you start to understand these things from a next level perspective. Yes, yes. We're, welcome back, Ocalix. Good to have you, man. Uh, big, big thing I like about Ocalix, you know, you're always thinking IMO. You're always thinking about, you know, how can I use this that, it, that is around me um, in, in my garden to build my IMO, to build my soil and that nutrient cycling that comes with it so yeah man i appreciate you for always um kind of pushing the boundaries you know what i mean you don't just you kind of think outside the box and that's cool that 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 way you know things don't get stale you know what i mean we're always finding something new finding something that works better and like we always say there's lots of different ways to do the same thing you know what i mean so using what's available you big keys um Man, you've been doing a lot. You've been doing a lot with the EMs, IMOs. So, shoot, why don't we just talk about what you were just holding in your hand, uh, kind of start off the show, and uh, we'll just go from there. You muted. I got it. There we go. You got me? All right. Big fat old hint of the woods I found. I'm not going to eat it or anything, but what I'm going to do is this thing is going to get charred in a five-gallon bucket. I don't know if you can see all that hair, mycelium all over it, man. It's just been in that five-gallon bucket, <laughs> relaunching with mycelium. But this is all going to get, not all of it, but those mycelium that, that's growing all over there, I'm going to slice all that up, mix that up with some rice, and that's going to become a basic uh, hand of the woods, I'm a one kind of thing. The rest of that will go into the garden and the compost, and the idea is just to get spores, spread spores. I was telling Marco before we started uh, about, Two years ago, I did not have turkey tails in my garden. I have made turkey tail IMO for IMO three for about three years now, and this fall, I just started seeing turkey tails coming up in these dead log pieces that I've got in there, and some turkey tails ever in my garden, never. So this was the first time. <clears throat> so it's always fun just to know that I know there were no turkey tails. Now there are turkey tails. I grabbed turkey tail IMO three material from Tahlequah, brought it over here. And it inoculated my garden with turkey tails. And I've sent tons of turkey tail IMO3 to people all around. So I'm sure eventually they'll get some turkey tails growing in there. So, so uh, the idea that, you know, as I'm going out gathering stuff or to make IMO3 is finding the fungus and always gathering it up. Always getting the mushrooms, just taking it, throwing it in the garden. So who cares? Just put it in the bag, take it. But it's real beneficial if you can do that. <clears throat> So hey, Kevin, before, we get, the woods. before we get too deep into this, uh, the Bluetooth stuff that you're using, man, that's uh, popping a lot. 
I was hoping okay. if uh, maybe we could just turn that off. Maybe you could hear it just from your phone. I don't know why, but when you yeah. use that, sometimes it pops like that. Throw it over to Marco no, real thanks. quick. Doing that. Uh, Marco, do you mind kind of explaining about IMO1 and where somebody is obviously like this is kind of like hierarchy and understanding kind of what we're going to, to build on today. So we're starting off with some basic stuff. Just saw what is possible from Kevin. Uh, so what's actually going on there in the microbial world when you start with step one? Uh, step one is, is we're wanting to just make a collection. We want to take a inoculation from somewhere and bring it to, you know, to our place or to right to our garden or store it in a jar that can be used later. And so I am I am a one. You can use a lot of different things. Um, a lot of people use rice. That method is taught, you know, partially cooked rice a little bit on the al dente side, if you will. But um, lately, I've been using a lot of local grown grains to collect IMO because I'm thinking of it as if, you know, if IMO is what I want to collect. You know, I, I want to use a substrate that's somewhat local um, and grains seem to work out good. I've tried sorghum. Um, with much success but um yeah i mean i am a one is your initial start i mean it's when you've put out that uh collection vessel in the forest or under a nice uh, hardwood tree it's got lots of you know old growth on, around it and under it and then um you know once that colonizes get that uh gets webbing and uh mycelium and those kinds of things in it um you collect that and combine with sugar and then that goes to your next step of IMO. But IMO is that initial collection before you add anything in there to preserve it. So obviously, when you begin that collection, that is kind of like paramount to understanding this stuff, is that you know what you put in is only going to be amplified in what you get out. So crap in, crap out kind of concept. All right, yeah, so uh, Thor, grab it at, yeah. yeah, so... Uh, yeah, um, that's exactly well, what he said is how, how you do it. You know, a lot of people will think that the I that like um I like IMO one isn't your in game microbiology. It's like the beginning frontier biology that that has to get there first and really start chewing and breaking things down so that more and other micro microbiology will come in. Because once you get from IMO1 up to IMO3, you got lots of fungal networks going on. And you might not have that much in your IMO1. You might have more yeast and bacteria and stuff like that. But there's lots of ways to gather IMO1. <clears throat> As Marco said, you can use rice. He's using indigenous grains now. <clears throat> I use rice often. You can use potatoes, bread. You can uh, – man, I have actually – sliced off mushrooms and brown sugar and just like the turkey like that uh hen of the woods i showed you where all that mycelium is starting to come off i mean that's that's exactly what i want you slice it off crumble it up it's kind of like rice anyway mix it up with a little brown sugar and that was just a, a mushroom imo one it works that's the thing you don't have to follow the specific rules of of IMO one, we all call it IMO one, and there is a way to make IMO one, but there is also a general name and a general umbrella of IMO one that we do lots of work under, also. And so you can use lots of different materials. <clears throat> so there's lots of ways to collect IMO one. I was going to tell you a couple of ways that I've done within the last couple of years, and um, you've probably seen the bamboo poles where you got the long bamboo grow up. I've got big fat bamboo poles this big around in a grow that's about two miles that way. But you can split those bamboos on one side and they'll they'll hinge open for you. And I have filled those things up with rice and closed them back up and, and twined them up, set them out in the woods and gathered it that way. I showed it on Instagram. It's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> there's also, there's another way that's called... Uh, IMO bombs. And that's that's the name a lot of people say. But it's where you in like in the wintertime, go out into the woods, gather your material, you know, scrape the leaves back a little bit, gather that second layer of stuff, get about a half a five gallon bucket full, bring it back, and you can put rice in a jar in the five gallon bucket with the material. Sometimes I just put rice on a cardboard piece and set it down in that five gallon bucket with all of the gathered material. Cover it up in four or five days, you're going to have IMO-1, and you, you, you're you able to bring it home and not have to go out there and get it. You brought the material to you. You put it in warm conditions. You just take the material, and you recreate summer. That's all you're doing. 
and you, cre you, you recreate that environment in that five gallon bucket, then you have your IMO one that you uh, can collect over winter time. <clears throat> there is, um, I've done it. The best IMO one I think I ever made was from taking cooked rice. And I mean, I took a bunch. It was at least a five gallon bucket full of cooked rice and I dumped it in a tote. And then I dumped IMO three in with the rice. Not a lot, but just, just enough to really get it mixed up and just got it all good and mixed up. I let that set there and overnight hyphy was just illuminating out of the rice. And I let it go for another day, and there was never a sign of bacteria on it. It was like the perfect KNF rice. It was just perfect white hyphae all over. And that was, the, that was the first time I had done that one. Now, you can also take rice, and you can spray liquid IMO2 on back, back onto the rice. And you can kind of remultiply your microbes in that sort of way. So you can, you can take rice and mix IMO2, IMO3, IMO4, IMO5. You can mix it right back into rice and start your microbiology back over is it, kind of, in essence, what – what the theory would be behind it <clears throat> but that's kind of a knf experimentation on the judam side the way you make imo1 if you if you work with me it doesn't translate perfectly in language but the judam method of imo1 is to take wheat is to make jms get some wheat bran take the jms and spray the wheat bran with it and let that inoculate and sit there and start to mold out and you can crumble that up in your garden or beds or whatever so that's kind of like the judam side of making making an IMO one. So um, wh one more, one more cool way, pantyhose. You guys have probably seen, some of y'all have seen me do this on Instagram. Take pantyhose and fill them full of cooked rice, bury them in the ground and let them set there for a while. Now you can, in a week, you can take it out and you can mix that with sugar and you got a basic IMO one. But what you can also do is you can leave that you can leave the pantyhose in the ground over winter time. You can leave it there for a long time. After say two, three months over winter, you go back and you take that big blob of pantyhose, panty, or a big blob of rice in the pantyhose. Take that blob out and you mix it in with a a mixture of water and molasses, and basically you're creating your own indigenous EM. And, and you let that sit there and just ferment. You let those microbes ferment in that in that molasses water solution. It'll take you two or three months, but it's a it's a long term long-term project um, but in you know four or five months you have five gallon bucket of your own indigenous effective microorganisms basically an em1 that you made so that kind of branched off a little bit but then man there's lots of things you can do on that on that imo1 level yeah i wanted to throw it over to marco to see if you want to add anything uh into that kind of because i know like you marco you were the first guy i saw where you just started to play around with a lot of the the different elements and it seemed like acorn you know there was magic uh to that uh and and or maybe there's a few other things i would imagine using acorns or something like that even if you're just chopping them up emulsifying them using them as a mulch it's a seed so there's something special in my opinion about when you're using those over just maybe some other organic material yeah yeah acorns you could you can use those uh acorns to collect out your IMO as well, man. Um, you know, like, you know, I just like to always take it in a linear way for me. You know what I mean? I always like to go collection in the substrate, you know, IMO one, IMO two with sugar, and then IMO three inoculating a different pile, you know, different substrates of grains. From there, IMO four, you know, we'd add equal parts IMO three with your, your soil right there on your garden. Boom, that's your IMO4. And then if you want to get a fertilizer aspect, you can add manure to that and go IMO5. Now, I try not to jump, you know, kind of keep everything just so I keep it straight in my own mind, you know, as I that's kind of how I look at it. But like like Kev said, you know, there's lots of different ways to do this. Ultimately, we're trying to increase the microbial diversity in whatever we're doing. And so all these methods, as long as you're just kind of holding the principles, you know what I mean? They're all effective. There's lots of different ways to do it. And I don't like to necessarily tell people the exact way to do it because sometimes, you know, you limit their, their, their thought process, you know, and that's why I always wanted to try things like acorns, try different things that I found. And I was glad to see people coming up, you know, also trying them, you know, Kevin puts his stamp on it, trying them. Um, other people out there that follow both of us doing things that, you know, and, and posting it and showing us like, damn, these things do work. So 
um yeah man we're right on it right just take in a little bit learn a little bit from me learn a little bit from him learn a bit, little bit from everybody read a little bit and then you become kind of your own you know you have your own kind of style you know what i mean and all these things that we're throwing out at you are just different tools different methods different parts of our styles you know so think about it like that open-minded as we go through these things like when he's talking you know or i'm talking about something it might not necessarily be your step one you know it's all levels to this stuff your step one is going to be starting out trying to get good collections you know i recommend rice because that's that's an easy one everyone has it it's for it's forgiven then if you have want to go to grains go to grains you know so just try to for me kind of keep it learn it as you go and then experiment after you kind of learn it and then oh that works hey guys let me teach y'all what i'm doing here you know so that's kind of what this is all about and i think it's gonna be a, you know so it's gonna be a good show man yeah, I like that. I like listening. <clears throat> I learned a ton of this stuff from Marco, especially on the IMO three side, because wow. I saw him gather up like a truck full of acorns one summer or one fall. And I was like, man, I got a bunch of acorns on this property out here. And I gathered up a bunch of piles of it. And it took one message to him. And all the reply was, was make IMO three. <clears throat> I said, what can I do with these acorns? He said, make IMO three. That's all he said. And I love it. Cause that's, you know, that's how, uh, that's how I want to be treated. When I, again, when I went through my, my doctoral work, no one helps you. They don't want to help you. And ultimately you don't want them to help you because it takes away your creativity and you simply follow what they're having to tell you to do. So when people just tell you the end goal, just say, make IMO three, dude, that's it. I'm like, that's all I needed, brother. That was it. And so off And then I you went. got a direction. Boom. Yeah, you know, I just needed yeah. one step. I just needed a step forward. And I was like, I appreciate your, I was like, very thankful for it. And that's all I needed. I, you know, you don't, as a learner, as a person, as a disciple, a learner, a person who's seeking knowledge, <clears throat> you don't need to be told how to do everything. You need one step forward in something that you like. And then that's basically all you needed. I just needed a little direction. So you always just go figure it out yourself, be experimental. And like I said, in stages one of IMO, there are definitely rules you can follow. And there are plans that you can really try to imitate and mock and be like, dude, I nailed it. This is perfect. Look at this you know, collection I got. And that is that's that definitely a way to do it. And I have done that way. And then there's also experimental levels of, of things that you can do. And that's to me what makes it a lot of fun. And it all again, it all started. It's Marco's fault. He's the one that didn't give me any direction but one step forward. So now I had to make it all up myself. <laughs> I so love it. Man. I, I would imagine you guys agree that like someone's brand new to this, brand new to even gardening, let alone IMO making that they need to follow kind of that master recipe, replicate, replicate, kind of like a, an approach in, from a scientific standpoint, replicate what, what peer, what is peer reviewed, find a skill set in that, and then start to experiment once you've been able to replicate, replicate, replicate. What are your guys thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, there's wisdom in that. No doubt about it. Because again, once, when I, when I got into the organic, in the organic world, uh, back in 2018 ish, <clears throat> I was I had no idea what these people were doing. I saw them messing with rot and stuff like that. And the first thing I'm thinking is, guys, that's dangerous. Y'all going to get sick. You know, something you can't do that. <laughs> that was how I thought. And now it's like. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, shoot. I was talking about what was the question you asked me again, Brian? Where you're talking about probably getting sick. Like when you play around with IMOs, you start to realize that maybe this is how I keep myself from getting sick is actually getting my hands dirty in these soil systems, the diverse. Oh yeah. Uh, that's, that's that it. But, um, I saw, I posted a thing about a woman saying, uh, I don't know, some Chinese guy opened his rice maker and there's fungus all in it. And this lady, they po showed a woman saying, don't ever put your hands in fungus and microbes. You could get sick from it, stuff like that. Anyway, that's exactly what I was like whenever I got into organics. I, I, it was a little nerve wracking. You know, you're talking about mushrooms sometimes. All you've been told is those are deadly. And, you know, you do need a little bit of help when you get into organics. It's a, it's a nice thing to have. That's for sure. Whenever you get into organics, have somebody say, hey, look at IMO1. Look at IMO2. That's a good place to start. Start at labs. Here's, what, here's how you can combine the two. It's very helpful to have wisdom and knowledge and guidance and somebody who's been there before helping you. 
And what you want to do is reserve some of that. You don't want to use all of that because, again, it does take some of your creativity away the more you're told what to do. Get, get some basic guidelines and principles. Stay within the trees, you know, trying to go down the road and um, do it. Do it your because what ultimately happens is you're going to have to do it the way your environment allows you to. You can't you can only use what's in your environment. And so it ultimately starts to get shaped by your environment. So it does kind of change just necessarily. Mm, that was a gold bar right there. It does change. It does change because that what happens is what happened for me is I begin to notice more of what's around me. Just like you, Kev, when I saw like I'm like, this dude done hit a jackpot. He found like a truckload of old watermelons or it was cantaloupes or something at the time. But that it makes you observe what's around you and basically what what i look at is what is everything is it was a plant or what is it and where did it come from and then i say well damn i can use that how what is how does it break down how does it decompose and so you start looking at things like that that are around you and it does shape you because like even before i heard of jadam i got comfrey i got bakken 14 comfrey and i heard of comfrey tea they kept saying comfrey tea it was like some british gardeners and I was like, damn, comfrey tea. And it was, you know, so I got comfrey and then I made this comfrey tea. And then right no, not too long after that, I, um, um, you know, I heard Jadam for the first time and I started going down that rabbit hole. And then, boom, comfrey tea, JLF. Difference is when they made the comfrey tea, they didn't, they didn't toss in the microbiology, although it was already on the plants, it's on the leaves, it's in there. But I do like that aspect where, you know, Jadam, you're throwing in actually the intentionally throwing in that microbiology to kind of speed it up. So you're using what's available to you. I got a lot of comfrey. I started doing a lot of things with comfrey. I started experimenting more with comfrey and it just it just goes down a, a hole. Then you say, well, I want to grow um, stinging nettle because I hear that's like comfrey, but it's, you know, it's also good. So then you start growing that. So. It just evolves. And what we show you is you end, up, you end up seeing kind of the end result of everything, you know, and we show you how we do it as well. But you got to remember, you got to rewind back to kind of the beginning. Like we didn't start out doing all this different stuff, you know, like all these crazy ingredients and all this different experimentation. We started out kind of basic and then worked our way into that. So, um, man, people are getting real like big into this too um kev like people are really you know grasping onto it i see your followers are going way up you got a huge audience um are you seeing that and i'm also seeing it seems like the questions are getting more intelligent like the, everyone as a group is getting smarter and better at, at natural farming yeah no doubt about it so what i'm seeing a lot of is people who came into organics after me and maybe saw my page your page something like that but man i've seen a lot of guys really getting into understanding biology microbiology understanding the plants and soil and you know able to talk like an educated person on a certain field and you're, you're like see you you know you don't have to go to school for everything when there's when Sorry, a phone call. Uh, when there's a joy for somebody, or for sorry, when there's a joy for something, you know, it's uh, it's easy to do. Sorry, guys, I had a freaking phone call. Did that block? Did that shut me off? Can you hear me still? No, you you just blacked out for just a second. You're good though. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but yeah, a lot of younger people coming up, trying new things, and not only that, they're enjoying getting on social media teaching other people how to do it and just because they because because they'd like man this is fun watch they have confidence in what they're doing they like to show you now and uh that, that's what i see a lot of a lot of educational you know secondary education coming up coming off of what you started me doing you know people coming off of me teaching it now so totally see it. it's fun just get out there and like I, what i always tell these guys is they're like uh you know can you do this and this can you add that and that and i'm like you can do anything what you'll need to do is find out if it works. If it does work, you need to name it and tell us all about it. And if it doesn't work, you know, make sure we know that too. <laughs> but you know, you get to do right. stuff, you get to name it. Like Marco's Magnolia IMO3. You know, you know what I did with his Magnolia IMO3? This was this was one thing. I don't know if I ever told him or not, told you guys or not, but you sent me a bag of Magnolia IMO3. And I noticed that you're making another batch uh, this the, right now, I think. <clears throat> 
you sent me that bag and I was like, this stuff, I've never seen IMO3 before. Like that was the first time I had hands on IMO3 in my hand. You know, it's got to be a first time sometime. And that was mine. And I was like, this is so weird looking. And it wasn't weird looking. It was just at that time, it was like, this, right, right. Is, <laughs> like, this is valuable. That's what I was thinking. Like, this is dirt. This is this is soil. And this is valuable. Like, this is just not connecting yet. And I didn't understand how valuable it was. And I had that thing. I had that bag for about six months or so. And I started realizing, ah, this is the value of it. It's the microbiology. And so I stuffed, I emptied that bag and I stuffed it full of cooked rice. And that thing bloomed out within two or three days. And that's when I started my... Uh, um, integrated IMO, integrated IMO two. Where I just started taking microbes from your stuff, my stuff, candy natural farming. I took stuff from the soil guru uh, and just all over, and combined everybody's IMO ones and twos and threes and started mm -hmm. like biology from it and made a really awesome IMO two. You know? Man, I just got that. Just gave me chill bumps because that's to to me that's what it's all about. Like, I want that diversity, and if I can do so much, right? you can do so much well now i'm i'm piggybacking on you you're piggybacking on me so we're each adding more diversity to each other's gardens you know by way of the work we're doing and and i just took the magnolia thing a step further like i'm doing a pile now and i just did it with a lot of magnolia pods so now i'm going to take these pods and then for my o horizon and one of my living soil beds this is going to be my mulch i'm going to sit gently you know place them all right over top of the soil one layer deep and just kind of have them nestled down there real good and just start watering my soil and just go on see how long that layer takes to break down because usually my mulch layer breaks down in one growth cycle so now these magnolia pods being a little bit more you know robust if you will than just straw i'm curious to see how they do over time so um just always thinking like you know so what we're talking about man we're just saying doing the same principles i'm making imo3 well hell i might as well toss in all these at magnolia pods while it's working and then when i end up with is a you know a big pile of imo3 and then i got all these pods as an as a little bonus also going to toss them in with my isopods in the springs just to see if they like them what they do um you know and go from there yeah, they're yeah, going low, man. Yeah, those are big, chunky looking. Yeah, they're, they're nice. I found a batch of uh, a, a bunch of magnolia trees out in a park over here in the Tulsa area, and they are littered with them. So, there will be something that me and my boys will be picking up soon, just for again, just in addition to IMO3. And you know, <clears throat> here's one thing I used to think like, your when I got your bag, I of uh magnolia tree imo3 i remember thinking this is so almost sandy like grainy and it was very just fall out of my hand when i grab it it wasn't soil you know it was dry and all that and um i just remember thinking like again this is this isn't soil <laughs> there's there's no value to this i still cannot understand the value to it but um you can get his was sandy because maybe he maybe marco strained it i don't know but what don't worry about big chunks big chunks are okay when you make a big batch of imo3 go ahead and go ahead and put the big sticks that are you know this big in there and that big around if you can't break them throw them in there so what they're going to get inoculated is the idea and you can either pick the big chunks out or what i do is i just set over a over a tote i set you know chicken screen chicken wire and just you know grade it out and 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 get it get the big stuff out and i call that chunk imo but it can be thrown into the garden which is going to be great because y'all it's always good to have chunks of wood in your growing area because that fungi just loves it so i'll throw that chunk imo in the garden most of the time not in the compost because i like it a little more grainy a little more work down <clears throat> but get chunky stuff get those big magnolia pods in there and let them get inoculated and later separate them out and keep the keep the grainier stuff for growing and then and go inoculate something with those big chunks that you've got in the in the imo3 you made yeah man i um yeah i used to when i would um send bags i would just it would be everything but then i got to where um i started screening it i just liked the way the consistency of it and and then i take all that chunky stuff you talked about after you've been sifting and screening you know all day or whatever 
And then that goes in my beds. Like that goes in my cannabis bed. That goes around my veggies and everywhere else. And that's just stuff that, you know, it's still good. And it could be shipped and it could go to anybody's, you know, in their garden. But um, I just like to screen it out because that way I feel like they, it's just a little more consistent. Um, just IMO. And then, and like I said, I get to keep that stuff for myself, you know, so. Uh, follow the progression here. Uh, I wanted to ask more questions about now moving into IMO2, especially with a lot of people wanting to experiment uh, with the sugar aspects into this second level. Uh, do you guys mind talking about that? Maybe some of the sugars you feel like are obviously tried and true. Brown sugar, obviously, is the main example of that. But some people Marco, like to play around with some of those different sugars. Uh, yeah, kick it off with Marco. Um, yeah, yeah. S sugar, uh, I definitely want unrefined. You know, we want raw sugar. I like jaggery, excellent sugar. Um, least refined, you know, white sugar has been stripped. White sugar, everything's taken out of it that's good, pretty much. Um, so I don't want to like, I don't like to grow my microbes with that. You can, yes, you can. However, I'd rather grow my microbes with a like a kind of a starch, you know, like uh, potato was mentioned earlier is a good one. Um, that's why we use the rice because there's a lot of rice starch, um, you know. So I a no, new one that I just actually stumbled upon, which I've, I've grown sorghum grain. And my ultimate goal would be, you know, I, I'll use that to collect IMO, which is good. That was one goal. I'd like to grow enough to be able to um, get some sugar out of it to press some of it. But I, I do a lot of um, <laughs> going to estate sales and just online auctions and stuff. So I bought this one lot. And it had this box of some Tennessee uh, jars of sorghum. And so they were like, um, you know, uh, quart jars of sorghum, which looks like molasses, like it's black or kind of almost greenish, but it's really, you know, thick and rich like molasses. So um, now I want to try that, you know, but I've been experimenting with that, growing some microbes. So um, the keys to that is just, you know, simple or, or basic kind of sugars, if you will, not refined. If you're going that route, I don't do a lot of molasses except for when I'm doing some maybe some liquid um, ferments and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. What about you, Cal? So, yeah, I just you I buy the cheapest brown sugar I can get my hands on right now. Um, the jaggery is definitely the is the premium quality sugar that you'd want to get unrefined type of stuff that raw sugar i think is kind of what it comes packaged as sometimes but yeah that's good sometimes guys there's only brown light brown sugar i mean sometimes that's it that's the only thing that i can get a hold so that's what i've got with some light brown sugar at the time and you know it'll it'll work the point is to get microbes into a state that they just cannot do anything anymore that's that's what that sugar basically does without getting too deep into it but so the brown sugar, the light brown sugar, it does actually work now. If, you, if you've got into scoping everything, then you can know exactly what was the best and all that. But I don't get into scoping anything. I just get into the methods that I know work. So I have used sorghum before. Um, whenever I've made, what was it, an EM1, I think it was. I used sorghum, and uh, I, it, it created biofilms whenever I would use it on, like, uh, chopped up cucumbers and tomatoes, you know, to put it in a bucket, get it all yucky. So that that sorghum did work for that one. You know, you can't use the point of um, at at the stage of IMO two, you're wanting to put brown sugar, not molasses, because molasses has such a high water content that it's just not going to pull the water out of the microbes. The brown sugar, it actually pulls moisture out of everything, and including the microbes. And that puts them into a stage of dormancy. And you can kind of, the idea is at IMO2 is that now you have this bucket of microbiology that is probably sporulating, creating endospores. And, you know, kind of like, okay, uh, I know that I can't do anything right now. So I'm going to create little babies so that when conditions are right, boom, we're going to explode and go nuts. And that sugary condition kind of holds your microbiology back until you put the IMO2 into a liquid solution and get it spread out and get the microbiology into an environment where they can really take off. And the sugar that's all over them basically is just then a, a little food source for them. But the IMO1 gather, 
out, outdoors, IMO2, you bring it in, you mix it with sugar, and now you have a batch full of microbiology. In the organic world, man, if you want to think about it, it's kind of like having recharge. It's like you've made your own little batch of recharge. Now, of course, there's tons of differences, but there are similarities also. You know, you've got a, you've got a goopy batch of microbiology that you go putting into something, and it's going to affect it. There's no doubt about it. Whatever microbes are in there, they're going to start to take off and do whatever they do. So um, I have used brown sugar, light brown sugar. I've never... And I've never, I don't even think I've used Jaggery because it kind of is expensive sometimes. What yeah. about the, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. sorry, uh, the beet sugars and stuff. What do you guys think about that? Have you played around with it? I know uh, Luna, you guys are familiar with her powder show. She's a, seems like a big fan of yours, Kevin. She's always popping around on Fridays and stuff. Uh, yeah. But she's kind of pioneered some of that stuff, <laughs> or at least she was the one that I first saw doing it and explaining it and stuff so that that kind of creates this unique aspect to it probably diversity uh what what are your thoughts on playing around with obviously marco's playing around with the rolls royce of, of sugars you know as far as i know and then the beet sugar is kind of in that middle from what i understand you know i used to make beer i used to drink i'm on the wagon i don't anymore but i used to make beers and wines and all kinds of stuff and there are um you know, in the beer making process, you use tons and tons of sugar, lots of grain sugar and things like that. I have never used those kind of sugars to make to like make an EM1 with. I've always wondered about about those uh, about the beer sugars I used to use. They're expensive. But it's going to cost you money to do it. So I've never done it myself. But there's lots of different types of sugars. Those beet sugars, you know, there's liquid sugars and there's the dry powdery sugars that would work different ways. But I've never used any of that stuff, but there's a whole range of sugars that you could go experimenting with. Yeah, and I think oh, oh there he is. I was gonna yeah. ask him a question. Yeah, Marco, man, jaggery, yeah. Jag, just the jaggery, all jaggery is the most basic sugar cane sugar. It's sugar cane juice pressed out and then dried. You know, that's it. And that, that's as simple as it gets. So that's why it's, it's so preferred. You know, very no processing is the thing. One process is to press it. You know what I mean? So, so Marco, do you think if I'm, you know, scientifically speaking as best we can for like a hypothesis sense, you set up one IMO for two on one side, IMO two on the other side. You have one side with the jaggery sugar. You have one side with the beet sugar. Do you think the same... Uh, microbes are going to be produced with those sugar sources. Well, remember, Brian, the sugar is where we're going to put them in a dormancy when we're talking IMO collections. I feel like um, if you have a sugar that has not got enough osmotic pressure, like like not granular enough, and I haven't seen the beet, you know, the consistency of the beet sugars to kind of hold them and play with them, but that's where I would stick to as granular as possible. Um, because if not, what's happened, what's going to happen is you're, you're going to get a liquid. You're going to get a, some some osmotic pressure where you have moisture being pulled out of the microbes, but it won't be all of them. And so what you're going to get is some of them are going to keep growing and then people are going to be like, damn, why is my IMO2 got, uh, you know, shit growing out the top of it? You know, it's blowing up because most more than likely you didn't use equal amount of sugar or you. um <laughs> <laughs> you didn't use equal. Enough, I enough thought that sugar. was great, dude. That's hard. I like that. <laughs> uh, you didn't use the right ratio of sugar, or you used the weak sugar as far as osmotic pressure, and so you know that that, that could lead to trouble for me. <laughs> I appreciate you explaining that because you know if you're trying to put something to sleep, then I would imagine that the possibility of the different levels of uh, like what do they call that the glycemic index. And so every mm. sugar is obviously different with that and how it affects microbes. If it obviously is affecting the gut and we're trying to think in that same manner when we're taking care of our plants, it's just something to think about when you're thinking like, okay, do I want to spend a little extra money for what sounded like a, the best way to describe it would be like a clean sugar, Marco, compared to something that's refined or God forbid, like a high fructose corn syrup, which is basically uh, like a chemical sugar which everybody knows is found in almost everything that's processed. Yeah, no doubt. And, and you know, Kev, it is a little pricey, you know, like a jaggery, like if I, a block of jaggery might be like, um, that might be like $18 or something for 11 pounds or something. But 
when you think and I and I had to think about that too because if when you think about how long our how far our stuff stretches, you know what I mean? So if you did 11 pounds of IMO2 rice, you know, with jaggery, I mean that's a lot and that will go a long way. So if you break it down kind of price per, you know, usage, then you can kind of justify, hey man, I might as well use the best sugar they got. I'm spending 22 bucks or whatever, and then I have this nice input, you know, that's kind of got the best uh, quality in it is kind of where I'm at. Yep, I agree. I agree. Right, so, I brown sugar. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, and that's what I love about this. I mean, you can have, you guys obviously come from different backgrounds, but at the same time, your mind seemed to work in the same kind of way of, you know what, I'm going to figure it out myself. I need a little bit of help. I think a lot of people, myself included, especially when I was younger, it was hard to even ask for help, even in like everyday shit. You don't want to seem weak or you know, whatever shit. Went down. So now at this aspect, when you're being able to take on this kind of stuff, ask a few questions, get the right guidance. I mean, it's this community has grown in the last five years from just a few people doing this to now I see probably hundreds to thousands of people showing off their compost piles. If they're you know on another level, the IMO pile, uh, just kind of understanding these concepts and a lot of this stuff, especially for you boys, uh, I think you might forget how advanced these concepts are to somebody that's first getting into this that doesn't even know what IMO stands for. So that's another reason why we wanted to have this show today. So climbing up this ladder, now let's talk about IMO3. All right, I got some sugars. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with the recipes that's kind of been tried and true so that I can replicate the process. Now I'm on IMO3. Uh, where do we stand on that, and what are your thoughts and tips uh, for that level? So IMO3 <clears throat> is a um, a whole new world. Like, you're applying the IMO2 to whatever you want, basically. Like, whatever you can scrape up in your backyard can become IMO3. So the way, the way I think about IMO2, 3, 4, and 5, because IMO1 is the beginning, but... IMO2 is is like your your storehouse. Like you, you've got all your microbes. Your storehouse is right here. You've made a big batch of good old microbes, and it's in a container. Take it anywhere. Apply it to anything. Well, if you apply it to a bunch of carbohydrates and carbon materials like acorns and nuts, like those magnolia pods, like bark, like twigs, mowed grass, leaves. I'm talking anything, guys. Uh, anything that's fallen to the ground, man, it can be turned into IMO3. Because the point of IMO3 is this, <clears throat> the IMO3 is now the carrier, the carrier of the microbes. Whereas IMO2, you're in your storehouse, now you're in the IMO3 area, now you have this carrier, and it's going to take your microbes wherever you want it to go. Man, if you want it to go into a growing pot, your IMO3 can take, can take microbes there. Now, you can do your IMO2 also. You can spread your IMO2 anywhere you wanted to, but your IMO2 isn't going to make a nice mulch layer. IMO3 is going to make a nice mulch layer. It's going to it's going to participate in building soil. Now, so will the IMO2, but you know what I'm saying? As th substance-wise, IMO3 is going to eventually become really good soil. That's what it eventually comes to. But the IMO3, uh, I have tons. I don't know if you all can see. Let me see if I can turn this. There are bare, all of this stuff here, every bit of those totes, those five-gallon buckets, these totes right here. All of that is what I have currently gathered in, within about the last three weeks of fall happening. All the nuts falling down, all the fungi growing up, all of the wood that, you know, has kind of under the last year's wood. All the bark that fell on the ground that's now been covered with leaves. Scrape those leaves back. That bark is covered with fungus, covered with mushrooms, covered with everything that you want in a good soil. Man, I have tons and tons and tons of that material. And what I will do is uh, I will take it to my friend at Kennedy Natural Farming. He's got a big shredder out there on his farm. He does all kinds of Jadon practices out there. But we shred everything, all the nuts, all the can old cannabis skeletons, stems, anything we can fit in there uh, in his shredder. We shred it up, and that all gets mixed up. And that is our starting point for an IMO3. All of that ground up material, like like Marco takes those IMO or those uh, magnolia pods, you know, he could either leave them big or he could shred them up. And they, all it's going to do is help them break down into the soil faster if he shreds them up. <clears throat> so 
I'll bring all that material back and I will use my IMO2. You know, I'll, I'll take a big couple of scoops of IMO2 and I'll put it in a five gallon bucket of water. I'll add a bunch of different inputs, whatever I might have. I don't have a specific recipe. There are specific recipes that lots of different people use uh, in different zones and all that stuff. So this, again, this is where it just breaks wide open in the IMO3 world. But I just gather what's in my environment, all the stuff on the ground, and uh, get it all crushed up. And then I use the IMO2 that I have made and I've gathered from all over my yard. Like I said, put some inputs, mix it up. It will cook for four or five days, depending on your environment. But soon you'll start to see fungal blooms on those woody bits, and you'll start to you'll start to see it, the microbiology starting to take over. In the KNF world, which is what IMO one through five is, it's on that side. It's not Jadam side. IMO one, two, three, four, five. That's on the KNF side. Um, <clears throat> IMO, sorry, about to have a big truck pass by. Give me just one second. It's that's my neighbor. He usually rips it. He didn't this time. Thanks, neighbor. But <laughs> IMO 2, or IMO 1 and 2, is all about capturing the microbiology the biology that you need to allow fungal chains and fungal networks to eventually begin to work. And so IMO 1 and 2, you get this base layer of microbes that you need. And when you apply that base layer of microbes to a dead carbon source or carbohydrate source, they start to break that stuff down. And then you start to have mycelial networks come in. And that's really that, that second layer of, of, that's the second effect. You have to have these base, what are they called? Saprobes and stuff like that in the microbiology world that, that just want to eat on dead things. And they kind of pave the way for other things that we actually are looking for, which are lots, lots of fungi to come in. But in the IMO3 stage, that's when you're actually trying to develop develop lots of fungal chains and so when you're cooking your imo3 um you know you're not wanting to just just, just turn it and turn it and all that you're kind of wanting to release heat if needed but you actually are wanting fungal chains to really form and you know it'll be it'll be pull apart it'll be like you picked up a brownie out of there sometimes because it's full of fungal networks but that is the goal on the knf side is to have lots of fungal chains <clears throat> Boom. Well said. Yeah. And and then for me, those chunks, they need to be broken up when that pile is not fully inoculated. Like when a pile is still parts of it that's not done, parts of it are fungi, really uh, thready. That's when you need to break that pile up and reshuffle the deck and then let everything kind of get inoculated. But you'll see each time you turn it, when you come back that next day or two or three, whatever that next turn is, you should be seeing that cake effect like like you were saying like if you poke a pitchfork in there you should be able to pull out chunks of that and um and that webbing is what's holding it together similar to the soil food web i mean this is just an exaggerated version of that and that's what we're doing is when we throw this in our soil now anything in that soil that's organic that's that hasn't been consumed yet by something um, this IMO and your IMO will start consuming that, will start attacking that. You'll see threads of fungi. You'll see it starting to break down. And that's why a lot of people, like for me, I like to spread out IMO3, and then I can um, toss on some straw on top of that, like some alfalfa or some timothy or something like that. And then when you water, now you got that um, IMO attacking the um, straw from below, and then the IMO is also attacking your soil, going on down into your soil, um, continuing that um that network so decomposition like you said saprophytic fungi that's what we're looking for those saprophytes they're breaking down uh organic material a plant can't just grab a piece of log or a stick and start sucking it and and, and live you know a plant has to break it has to feed off of uh, microbiology and that's what this imo does adding that to your soil and that is the the interesting thing though like I remember uh, watching um, Chris Trump videos, man. That was when I really, I was like, damn, that I am, that pie, I get what he's doing. That shit looks cool, man. I understand what he's doing. And I wanted to do that and really bad. So, you know, that's why I had to figure out, well, if he's doing IMO3, back up, you know, IMO1, IMO2, then go IMO3, learning along the way. But um, <clears throat> IMO3 to me is very valuable. If you make it there, you did something really well. You got something like this pile you see can just sit in a wood box or on the floor or in brown paper bags or cardboard boxes or whatever, and then be used whenever you need it. 
Um, what this doesn't have is like your soil, like there's a little bit bigger microbiology that's in your soil um, that's not in this because this is mostly just fungi, some bacteria, but mostly fungi, yeast and things like that. So that's how that's when we go to IMO4. We want to combine that good garden soil, that good soil we build that's got those larger orders of microbes in it combined with this now. Now you got fungi, bigger microbes, boom, IMO4 can still be stored the same way put in a box on the shelf whatever use it as you as you need it but um yeah i'm a three four and then five man it's fucking if you get you know can do all, any of these piles and be successful i think you did well and don't be afraid to do them and it didn't go great and start over re re rerun it you know if you need to until you get them right and the key when i say get it right keep your temperatures below 120 125 very max now, 120 is an awesome goal. Stay there, stay under. That means the fungi, the yeast, those kinds of things are not degrading. You know, when you get too hot, the only thing that runs in real hot temperatures is bacteria. And that's why when you get a real hot pile, it'll stink up on you because of that bacteria. So it's a few things to think about. Yeah, <clears throat> the the cooking part is important. Um you don't want it because it can go really hot. Like I've had a pile go up to 140, 150. When I came back, I'm like, ah, oh, come on now. <clears throat> but the like Marco said, the idea is you want to keep your temperatures low because microbiology, when they split, when that cellular structure, when it boop, when they split, it creates energy. It creates heat in the form of heat. And so there's lots of that happening, and it will get so hot that I put my hand in an IMO3 pile before and yanked it out fast because it was hot. And that's way too hot. At, a, at 120, it burns your hand. It feels like it burns your hand for sure. So at 115, you got a good hot pile. But I always keep mine at 115 because you're trying to preserve as much microbiology as you can. In the compost side of things, <clears throat> whenever you buy compost from a store, it is basically going to be thermophilic compost, which means it has been cooked so hot that basically only thermophiles are alive in it, right? You know, whenever they're done with it because it's been cooked to they want to get bacterias and they want to get e coli out and stuff like that but my compost which is right there behind this camera is it's man it's never turned it's just contained i dump junk in there and the biology eats and consumes i never turn anything uh, at all but um like my like marco said the imo that imo3 man when you mix when you mix IMO3 with a, com a good compost that's loaded with biology, uh, like my compost is, then you got a great growing medium, which is called you know IMO4. But if you've cooked all the microbiology out of your IMO3, you know, and you've cooked it all out of your compost because it got too hot in the sun, you know, you just got good nutrient material, but you don't have a lot of microbiology in there, and and that's needed also. So temperatures are kind of an important thing. Um, I don't say kind of. I want to say it differently. Temperatures are an important thing. Make sure you stay in the. Make sure you stay in a good range. Um, but really, once you've made IMO three a couple of times, you're like, I, I know what it's. I know about where it is. I can stick my hand down in my in my IMO three and be like, it's too hot. I can feel it with my hand because one fifteen just is. It's hot, but it's not burning hot. At one twenty, one twenty five, it yanks my hand out quickly. So that's just from experience, though. <clears throat> yeah well so, you know 120 that's a, that's just a scientific number that um fungi and yeast degrade start you know 120 to 125 so yeah to each his own you know in, in my world a lot of the the people that are trying to breed isopods for either you know monetary gains or feeding them feeders and that kind of thing the, the casual consensus right now is that you have to replace that soil because they start off with such basic things that just, you know, some coconut fiber, some sphagnum moss, no life. It eventually uh, compacts and dries up and all of these different things. So from a, an isopod standpoint, if you're watching this, uh, you know, part of our audience now are people that are trying to build bioactive setups. In my opinion, part of the secret sauce that I've had for a while now is buying all these different IMOs from people that I admire and using those different IMOs at different time points. So sometimes I would use Marco's, sometimes I use Johnny's. Uh, I had a, another connect here in Colorado where I was also mixing that with bunny poop until unfortunately, 
you know, my buddy passed away. So the manure aspects and buying, buying the time again, if you will, when you're getting an IMO3 is you're buying somebody's artwork, in my opinion, just because it's a soil system. I myself thought it was wasn't as valuable, especially in the early days of just even using like decaying leaf litter. I don't think when you first get into this from a plant standpoint or from like a bio, you know, an isopods bioactive standpoint, there's no way to really drive that home until you see this personally, like with the naked eye, or you or you go out of your way to buy some IMO so you can see with the naked eye what what that should look like. And then that life from that point on just seems to take hold. And if you continue to add leaves and organic matter, the sticks, the decaying wood, the things that you would find out in the woods, deep in the woods, that's why I never ever had to replace anything. And I continue to uh, put leaves on there on a weekly basis. And I would imagine that most people that are breeding isopods at the level that I'm at cannot keep up with that because they have to continuously change out these soil systems. So these guys are giving you, in my opinion, you know, not even understood levels of knowledge for our little world when we're talking about isopods and that kind of thing because nobody talks about that and that's why the consensus is you have to replace these and people just don't really grow isopods on soil because of the fungus gnats thrips white flies all the common problems that we've had in cannabis so i just wanted to take a moment to if you're if you're watching this and you don't understand exactly what's going on i promise you if you go down this rabbit hole you're going to be 10 levels of head of anybody else in the isopod world because this IMO thing is something that really doesn't make sense, kind of like what Kevin was alluding to, until you go down the rabbit hole and you start to see it. It's like, all right, why would that matter? Oh, it matters because of the diversity. We're talking trillions of things here, worlds upon worlds upon worlds. You know, the, the famous uh, phrase that got my attention, I learned from Jeff Lowenfels was, when you take a tablespoon of this high-end soil with an IMO, just everything that is like optimal, there are more microbial aspects, life, than there are people on this planet. So when you build these big raised bed systems, that takes a while, but that is why eventually that becomes almost priceless because you continue to drive out high-end cannabis for literally pennies on the dollar. I'm choosing to do this just more with isopods. Other people could find skill sets growing the microgreens that all the, the true Michelin chefs are after for that taste. I learned last month alone that you, if you want to grow high-end wedding flowers, there's a huge demand for that. So there's a lot of things that from these soil systems, from IMO systems, taking it to the next level, you can find and monetize those skill sets. Yes, sir, all day. Why don't you um give us a quick rundown on that while well, just we're talking IMOs, but how, what's up with the EMs, Kev? I see you doing a lot of the EMs. Are you creating those from scratch? And maybe just give yeah. everybody a little rundown of getting through that process. Let me get you a jar real quick. I'll show you. All right. Good stuff. <clears throat> it's right here. This is called EM5. Look at that. Effective microorganisms five is basically what it looks like, guys. It kind of looks like an OHN. I explain it as an OHN with microbiology, kind of. Uh, EM5, <clears throat> go look it up online and see if you can find an article about it. You're going to have a hard time finding just specifically some EM5. You're going to find something, but it's, you're going to find EM1 through, you're going to find EM1 and 2 for sure. You'll start seeing a three and a four stage also. And then there is a five stage. And, um, you know, EM1 is a copyrighted name. And that's why a lot of times in the organic world, things can be confusing. Because I call this EM. I don't call it EM1. When I make it, when I make my own labs and my own molasses and I mix those together, I, call, I refer to it as EM because EM1 has been taken, right? <clears throat> but we're making kind of the same exact thing is, is the idea. And so when we say EM, effective microorganisms, it's kind of like we, we've taken the name from oh, the guy that made it. I can't remember the doctor or so-and-so that made the EM1 stuff, but we're using his name for it. That's why it's called EM, EM, effective microorganisms, and it's at level five. And level five, it becomes an IPM. And so what I've done is I've taken an EM, effective microorganisms, that I made with my molasses, and um, I used hash water labs in this EM5 that I made. And so I'll back up just a little bit. This summer when I grew all my cannabis plants, I cut them down, froze them, 
had all of that washed, and then I took the cannabis flowers back, right, the washed cannabis buds. And I also took the hash, the water that was used to wash my flowers also. It's called hash water. And with that hash water, I made labs. Then I took that labs that I had made, and I dumped it back onto the washed cannabis flowers, and I'm making fermented plant extract with it currently. And the other cannabis that uh, got thrown into my garden and um, all of that. But the labs that I made was hash water labs. And I mixed that labs with molasses. And that became my EM base that I used. And you can tell it looks like, it, you know, it's dark. It looks like a, an EM one. But what's the you, ratio you use on that? Like, how do you, does he, do you have a quick recipe for folks that are, you know, want to know? For, for just a basic EM? Is, like if they had hash water, then how much molasses to hash water kind of oh, thing? And what are they doing? Oh, okay. That, you know? So like, so what I did was I had that five, I had a five gallon bucket of wastewater, basically hash water. And what I did was I took, um, I took a sack of rice and I dumped the rice in the wash, in the rice wash, I'm sorry, in the hash wash. And I let that rice sit there for about a day. I just kind of massage the rice every once in a while. Then I strain that liquid out, right? The hash lit, the hash water um, that had been soaking on rice. It set for about four days and fermented. And then I added the milk, and that's how I got my that's how I got my hash water labs. And so when I took the when I wanted to advance this into EM5, I, I took oh well, let's see, I made five gallons of this stuff, so. I can't remember exactly what I took, but the ratio would be like, if you wanted to make EM, you take a pint of labs and a pint of molasses, mix them together, and you're, you've made EM. So, but if you want to advance that to EM5, you're going to need like vodka, you're going to need peppers, cinnamons, garlic, uh, lemons, oranges, anything zesty, anything that's got a little kick to it that bugs probably wouldn't like, you know, if we could pull the oils off of it. And what we're doing is we're taking all of those ingredients. And I used, again, I used lemons, oranges, limes, cinnamon, garlic, cloves, and I used maybe something, oh, jalapenos. And then I used an extract vodka. It was a vodka that had been setting on garlic uh, for like over a year. And that was my alcohol I used. But all of those ingredients, without getting into the ingredients specifically, it is on my Instagram page. All of those ingredients are combined, and you'll add some of your EM that you made, and then you fill the rest up with water. And basically, I used, let's say, I used about this much EM that I made, over half. And then I, in this in this jar, it was uh, it was um, three shots, three ounces of vodka. And I had, um, I actually, oh yeah, I also added some bacteria. So I also added a shot of Bacillus uh, subtilis. I think it's how you say it. Um, besides the besides the lab bacteria that was in here, so I added a little bit of extra bacteria up in this thing. A little bit of vodka. You have also what was in here was a bunch of orange pills and cinnamon sticks and garlic and all that. You can kind of see there's a little bit of settlement on the bottom there, maybe, but. All of that will be gotcha. combined in that jar, and it will set there for two weeks and ferment. And it's going to be a slow ferment. You're not going to see like a beer alcohol bubble. You're going to see just little bubbles, you know, kind of come up every once in a while and do their thing. It's not a heavy, not a heavy, heavy ferment, but it does ferment. And after two weeks, you're going to strain all that liquid off, and that that's this is what you end up with is an EM5. And this, I will use one ounce of this to one uh gallon of water and sometimes i'll use two gallons for of, water IPM? of em5 for ipm yeah, one, for ipm Margot, as an ipm that's correct okay. for ipm so one ounce of em5 to one gallon of water if i want to use ohn as a as an ipm that day too i will use a two gallon sprayer and I'll add about I'll add about an ounce of EM, about an ounce of OHN, about an ounce of labs, you know, and that all goes into a two gallon thing. And not a lot, just a you know, an ounce is that much in liquid form, just a little shot glass. 
And that's a great IPM. And guys, that was all I IPM last summer until I started to having to have to use BT because the caterpillars got so bad. But my entire IPM spray was was EM5, OHN, and Labs forever. And if the plants are healthy, they they don't need a lot of extra help. If the plants are healthy, they can they can have bugs on them, and they're not going down. Like you can, have, I have aphids on my plants out here. But my plants are healthy. It's in balance. Uh, you know, I got ladybugs too. You know, I got I got praying mantis also, and I got I got spiders. I got all kinds of stuff. They're growing all over these plants, but everything is in balance. And so, using a good IPM like that with a healthy plant, good to go. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, I like that. What does that smell like? So you probably it's probably kind of smells kind of OHN and a little a little cheesy or what? Right. Very OHN, no doubt about it. And you can smell a little funk, not a lot. There's not like you gotta, you gotta know what you're smelling for. Just a little. Now you ain't sipping her, are you? Mostly, I'm on the wagon. I don't sip it, but it definitely smells good, like okay, a wintry, okay. yummy mix. You know what I'm saying? A good winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cinnamon and ginger and all that good stuff. Gotcha. That's EM5. All right, well, check out his IG to get the, the rest of that process, man. Get you from one to five. But um, again, making making your own inputs that's dope, you know, saving money. You know, no need to buy that bottle of trademarked uh EM. And I still have a bottle like that should last forever. Still, I still had that first gallon bottle I bought years and years ago when I was didn't even understand I could collect my own microbes, you know what I mean? But now that we understand that, I think you know, you kind of skip. You can skip certain stages of the process now. If you make your own shit. And I like that about this community, that the community is willing to uh, basically teach these uh, IMOs. People obviously sell those. But the EMs especially, because it seemed like that information was hoarded for a long time, especially like 2015, 16, 17, 18, before the explosion of of knowledge, honestly, wisdom of, of people doing this and then continuing to break it down so it's easier and easier for people to uh, not only kind of comprehend things, but absorb it enough to have the skill sets and wanting to risk the money uh, to start to see if they can do it themselves. And a lot of people don't find success when they first do this, but I think that they see the reason why this is so fun to kind of incorporate in life is because it is hard. But once you have that skill set, you have it for life. Hey, can I take you on a quick tour of my material that I've gathered? Uh, it's just right over here. You can see it easily. Absolutely, man. This is your show, brother. Please right, do. Me. So let's see. I got to turn the camera here. No, I can. I'm going to show, show you like this right here then. So this is this, this is all cat. All of this stuff is covered up right here because it's been it rained last night. So that's why everything is covered up. But in all these buckets are just things that I've been gathering. And like and like this is that hint of the woods that I found. It's so valuable. But keep looking. Check this out. This is a new one, Marco. I don't know if you saw my channel, but guess what? Guess what these are? Ugh, let me get the camera right. These are beaver chips, dude. This is where a beaver went and chopped down a bunch of trees. Oh, nice. And I gathered all of his chips. And I have almost a five-gallon bucket full of them. I'm going to make beaver chip IMO3. How about oh, that's that? A good that would be one. awesome. And so check it out. Lots of wood. Like I said, Fungi loves wood. But look at the look at the wood. That was bark. And it just crumbles into perfect, I'm you know, perfect IMO3 material. That is good stuff. So Right there, there's more bark because it's just good stuff. Like I said, this right here. Oh, check this out. This was from a tree. This is bark that was on a tree that was on the ground, and I just peeled the bark off. The tree is still there. The tree was dead, but just look at the bark. Look at and you see all the the microbiology. It's already been working. All the dusty. It's broken down. Got white fuzz all over the place. That's what I call you already. It's already built in. Like you have okay. IMO built into the process. You know what I mean? So check it out. He's exactly right, guys. When you when your starting material looks IMO-y, when it's already got white on it, it might have some mycelium growing on it. It's going to cook up fast, and it's going to be awesome. It's gonna it's going to come out in brownies. You know, you're gonna be pulling out chunks of it. 
So if you start with good IMO three material, and I love to start with uh, what's called bamboo IMO. Uh, Y'all seen some of that bamboo stuff that I've gathered before. It makes amazing IMO three because it's it's loaded with biology. But continuing on, check this out. This is just leaves. This is just like second layer leaves. The the top leaves have fallen on these. I, I, I moved the top leaves off of these. And this, you can see the color's gone out of them. And they just look broken down. But again, that is, that's just good for IMO3. It's pure carbon. It's, it's great for biology to climb on and live on, feed on. Oh, yeah, more beaver chips. Check it out. This is all pecan shells. These are just run over pecans. There's tons of them out there in my road out there. So you can see just, um, just pecan shells. Pow. They're, right? they're right up there with acorns, basically. You know, same nice. concept. Check this out. This is more more bark off of that off of a tree that I liked. Pine. Tons of pine cones in here. This was turkey tail, guys. That was turkey tail that I ripped off of a bunch of of a bunch of logs I saw. I saw, so I'm gonna get a lot of turkey tail in there. And then this is tons of acorns. Boom. See all those? Those are acorns. All acorns. I got a wheelbarrow full of acorns. So that's loaded, the ride, man. That's where it is right now. And all of that material is gonna get cooked up, right? Like we've been talking about. I'm gonna add a bunch of this stuff, like. All these inputs that I've got, this is a five gallon bucket full of IMO2. And last night, a armadillo knocked it over, spilled a bunch of it. He was trying to eat it. But I want to use that IMO2. I'm going to use all of those inputs and stuff. I'll mix a little bit up, have all of that crushed, put the carbon and carbohydrate material in with all the inputs, and that stuff cooks up. It gets covered with biology, and then, like I said, I can transport all that biology now with the IMO3 form that it's in, and we can take it anywhere. I can send it to you, right? That's the, that's the cool thing. It weighs way less than IMO2. People want IMO2 often. I'm like, yeah, you can definitely have some IMO2, but you could, take, you could buy my IMO3, get a lot more. When you get the box, put your rice in the box, make some IMO1, and then you got my IMO2. Right, that's how you do it, right there. That's what IMO three is is the pivotal point for the IMOs. It can go in so many directions. You want to get to IMO three because it's super useful and it's fun to make, guys. You get into nature when you get that IMO three level because <clears throat> you got to start gathering things. You got to start lifting things up and looking to see if there's a snake under there or not. You know, you're dealing with nature now. You're gathering things off the ground, and nature fights back. And it's fun and exciting to get out there and see what's growing, man. You find big old funguses. You don't know what they are. Post it on Instagram. Somebody's going to tell you, boom, you learn. I posted a bleeding tooth fungi. You saw that, Marco. Uh, when you squeeze it, it pushes out that red blood. And I had no idea what it was. I didn't know if it was a good or bad one. Um, but it's a bleeding tooth one. And uh, found all kinds of mushrooms. So it's exciting. I always learn when I go out in the woods and gather all kinds of IMO3 material. I always find new spots that had some kind of mycelial breakout. You know what else I've learned? Um, always at the base of trees. I mean, it seems to make sense because that's where a lot of the root is, are established. But if I'm out in the woods, I don't just go into the open field. I'm going to go next to the tree, right in that area. Where that tree starts to come up, I'm going to look all around there. You're always going to find a lot more biology and activity just close to the roots. You know, bamboo has has the most biology of grass, of different types of grass. A, ba a basic, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a Japanese bamboo. It has the most biology. It tracks the most biology to its roots. And so I have that big bamboo grow right by my house over there. And all around the bamboo poles, right where they come out of the ground, I've shown it before, it's white. It's like frosting. And you can dig it up, and it will be that thick. And it is on my Instagram page last, last fall, or no, last spring, digging around those uh, uh, bamboo poles, live ones. 
the the biology was thriving and it was just unbelievable and i got online and started looking up a lot of uh, a lot of the doctoral work on bamboo and things like that and started to learn that it just has tons of biology lots of bacillus bacteria live in the live or or actually or i should say are symbiotic with bamboo they work together and bamboo attracts those type of bacteria so looking at the base looking at the roots of things digging back right beside right by the roots of things and looking for the biology that's always a good place to gather stuff up yeah yeah great point on the bamboo and, and one of the reasons is bamboo grows so fast you know what i mean and so when it's growing so fast it's it's got all those microbial interactions going on that nutrient cycling so it's promoting the nutrient cycling for itself and its fast growth i wife and i we walk by bamboo all the time in the summer i'll say look at that bamboo and you know remember where that is we'll walk by two days later and it'll be two three feet taller and she'll see it like damn that really is you know so bamboo grows really fast don't sleep on your um prairie grasses too like um for the same reason like our native grasslands those are great places to put a imo collection box you know to be able to get you some imo out there too um so yeah that the, those um grasses are very uh you know they do grow some microbes you know and bamboo is a grass as we all know yeah i wanted to throw up a question uh somebody that i know is well known in the uh, reptile world uh, you know kind of more like tarantula spiders just understanding these things. Um, and the question is, and I think this is because I want this side of the community to start to think differently. Uh, when I first got into this, they would assume that you just decontaminate everything, clean something. So if an animal, animal defecates, well, now you got to clean it with a paper towel or uh, some people use putt-putt grass to like leave it for a couple of days, then you would remove the, that. So when it comes from like a decontamination aspect, point, I was hoping we could talk on, well, we're just overpowering with beneficials here. We're kind of using Mother Nature to combat Mother Nature. I was hoping you guys could talk about that from a very like uh, beginner standpoint, because I do want more people in the uh, spider world, isopod world to understand that Mother Nature figured this out a long time ago. Uh, why don't we just try to mimic it as best we can? Go ahead, Margo. Um, yeah, well, so i looked at it and i've been thinking about the terrariums and things like that and i look at it like the living floor chicken coop living floor pig pen i got the living floor going in my chicken coop um which that consists of a floor think about it it's all try to scale it in your mind terrariums just a smaller version um a floor which is made up of a um a lot of micro uh by high biological material you know lots of biology in the floor i use a lot of imo shredded leaves wheat bran things like that because you want a little bit of the aspect of soaking up you know part to it you want a little bit of that sponginess to it and um so i build that you know that floor and i'll have a lot of imo3 in it and a lot of leaves and a lot of leaf mold and what happens is the microbes in the floor will break down that waste before it has a chance to get, you know, toxic before it has a chance to build up. And even inside my chicken coop, you know, like you don't see the poop, like you might see the poop one day and you look the next day it's gone because we learned this listening to um, young Sang Cho at the Jadam event. You know, he says, when you have a living floor, the, the waste becomes food. So the animal's waste in turn becomes food to feed the animal again, because if it isn't, it's not eating its waste, what it's doing is consuming that microbiology that ate its waste. You know, it's consuming those worms, those black soldier flies, the small microbes, bits and pieces of the floor itself when they're pecking around, they're eating, you know, and, and that just becomes a cycle of, of cleansing. So for me, the terrarium, I, I think you need about four inches to me. If you're gonna try that living soil, I think about four inches will probably be minimum. If you go thicker, if you got a deep, some might, you know, 55 or whatever deep, to, you know, uh, terrarium, go deeper if you can, you know, and, and I would even try to, and I've done it in my little isopod terrarium. I made a horizontal soil right there, you know, started with the gravel, sand fill, you know, layers, 
A horizon and then on into the O horizon, you know, and I just kind of made it its own soil, made because the soil is what's going to be what breaks everything down. So, um, just kind of my thoughts on that. The living soil will be key, kind of replicating that in the terrarium, and you got it. It's gold. Kevin, you got anything to add to that? For you know, again, I've been real thinking base. about this. I don't, I'm not a, I don't have any reptiles of any kind. I have five kids. You might consider them reptiles maybe, but they poop a lot also. But the, I think the thing that I would think about from an outside perspective, looking on, looking into the reptile world is like, how much does your animal poop or like regurgitate or whatever it might do? Like if it does a lot of pooping, you know, it gonna, it's gonna be, poop left around for a while but if it's if it's just little droppings and stuff i would like marco said microbiology consumes things quickly if it's just a little turd on the ground every once in a while that living soil i would assume eats the turd right up and moves on keeps on trucking instead of it you know just sitting there on a paper towel but the size of the animal matters i would assume and that you know that would have to matter how much depth of soil you have you know, to fight back against how often it's getting pooped on. So there's a lot to the out from the outside perspective. I always wonder about how, how is that? How, you know, what are the ratios? Cause it definitely That's a great works. point. Man. It, it's mother nature. It's going to work. It just recycles nutrients. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a great point is I, I think you got to size your terrarium proportional to your reptile. Like no, you can't cram them in there. You know what I'm saying? If you got to, six inch reptile i feel like you probably need to have at least a 40 inch space you know lengthwise you know and then width you got to have enough space i'm not sure but to me the the folks that know reptiles y'all got to consider that y'all got to think about the size of that reptile and then volume of soil and to me there's a lot of room to figure that out like you know, if somebody like myself was got into reptiles, I guarantee you, I would, I would kind of crack it because I would that would be a focus of mine. I just kind of would need that focus if I had that reptile and kind of make it a goal. And I've been thinking about it, man, but I just ain't sure what you know which direction to go with them. You know? Yeah, I found too. Uh, like for me, my I guess my only experience in the reptile world is with a bearded dragon. They do seem to defecate pretty often. Uh, but I don't notice it because I am using a living soil side and then a sandy side on the other. And when I first was building this, uh, when the animal would defecate, I would just take one of the mini master springtail cultures, sprinkle a few of those springtails directly on the, de the fresh defecation. And then, you know, a day or two would go by and that would happen again. I'd sprinkle some more. Eventually, the springtails are almost programmed, if you will to go after decaying things. And so they're one of the first ones before even isopods, they're going to break down that defecation. So if you need something to break down quick, uh, I would recommend using springtails to get that going. If it's something larger, then obviously that's where the isopods have become famous because they can be a food source and clean up after the, the reptiles. I saw that, uh, uh, Leah, one last question. Uh, shout out to you, Leah. I think you're a... a one of the fine pillars of the reptile community, uh, hanging out with obviously two of the uh, the fine dudes uh, in the cannabis uh, community. Uh, yeah. Can you essentially clean out pesticides? So I get where you're going with that too. When a lot of people try to kill these grain mites and stuff in the reptile community, that's what's kind of the boogeyman in that world are some of these different mites that could potentially kill a spider, potentially kill a, a, like a larger bearded dragon if they get out of control. Have they looked at also predatory mites like we use for our to protect our cannabis plants? Is that something that they're doing in there? They're learning that from myself and Mark, basically. So a two two man operation that's really not enough. But uh, a lot of people, when they hear mites, Marco, to be honest, they kind of freak out because mm -hmm. they don't realize, especially like in the early days of russet mites and spider mites, when somebody would hear a predatory mite, uh, Californicus or something, mm -hmm. you just kind of assume that that was a negative thing or wouldn't be effective. Uh, but the reality is obviously that, uh, in my opinion, the hypiosis miles using a, a rove beetle as well uh, seems to be that kind of magical uh, formula, if you will, to not have the soft-bodied insect problem. I feel like, man, I tell you, the living, like how yours is set up, Brian, with the grasses or whatever, the cover crops in there, 
think about it like i want to do that for my rabbits but they eat grass so it's a challenge right with a reptile they don't eat the grass so you should be able to set up a really nice living floor you would think in a reptile pen and it's also probably going to be decorative like you know you're going to see a layer of soil and you'll see a little greenery then you, you know instead of just like putt putt carpet or something in there you know i don't know man i think that's the that's the way to go i think people should really start experimenting with that because what happens is in our soil if you get a little explosion of grain mites or whatever um it's going to balance itself out in the soil i can see how in a terrarium now if you brought in those grain mites or they got introduced there's nothing to keep them in check so i would implore people to look into it and thinking about living floor and if you're really serious about it hit me up on on instagram because i'd like to you know talk through it i'd have questions you could probably know more about the in-depth that you know kind of answer my questions and maybe we can you know kind of figure something out but yeah like brian and you're already on it i mean to me living floor would be the key in these in these setups yeah, this is uh, we like to say gold bars on this show. I don't, I don't even know what that would be in the reptile world. Probably a platinum bar or something, because no one's thinking that way. But I promise you, for everyone that's watching today, that's in more of that reptile space, this wave comes whether you want it to come or not. If this wave is coming in the cannabis space, where it was actually fought by multi-million-dollar companies to try to suppress a lot of this information. And then, in my opinion, from COVID and kind of that stuff where everybody was stuck inside, podcasts became not not necessarily as silly for somebody that might only be speaking to a few people. I mean, back in the day, that was considered kind of silly and a waste of time. And now I think a lot of people are seeing that uh, the, the educational levels that you can get from a podcast is, is next level. And the bioactive side, I've seen, uh, or I'm sorry, from a living soil side, I've seen in cannabis the explosion of growth within the last five years. And I promise you that that's going to happen in the reptile space because it's so much easier, the same way with growing cannabis, it's easier for the farmer to adapt this. It gives you back your time that you're used to spending on cleaning up tanks, uh, constantly uh, removing manures, dealing with the smell or putting up with the smell of animals like that. Uh, you can remove all of that kind of stuff by creating a living floor. And I like the way that Marco is saying that because it's not even just bioactive. Like To some people, that means you just have plants in the setup. There's actually things going in that soil system, breaking things down, improving the soil system, protecting the soil system. And that is a living floor. And that's uh, maybe a new catchphrase there from Marco. But that is something that uh, um, I think is paramount for anybody that doesn't want that wants a better life for their animal and doesn't have to actually pick up after them uh, a couple times a day. I mean, just to even see up now, my wheels are turning just a little, I'm not going to go too deep, but even to have, if you have the luxury of having two setups, you have your animal in your one setup and if he's hard on it or if it kind of gets too out of balance and you kind of put him in the other setup, let him work that and you kind of let the other one rejuvenate. And kind of go back and forth like that you know i don't know lots of different ways to think about this stuff if you start going down a rabbit hole but i think for me the ultimate goal is everybody growing up and whenever someone had a snake you the first thing you knew was that damn that thing's gonna stink you know what i mean like it just always did growing up it, it, people think the reptiles and shit always stunk so i know that's got to be something that they don't want obviously you want a really nice you know ten thousand dollar reptile or whatever they're very expensive and now you got it you know the, the enclosure stinks you know like you know what i mean like that that thing deserves a level of respect as an animal you know what i mean to give it that living floor to give it um that extra life and to let it that'll give it a better life probably make it more valuable probably make it live longer you know, start thinking like that. How long are you going to live on putt putt grass versus how long are you going to live on a little bit of a soil grass? You know, y'all know the feeling of that grass when it feels good and you just lay out on it. So, um, you know, just thinking from the mind of the animal. You know. 
That's a good point, saying it like that, too. Yeah. How long are you going to live on turf grass and how long are you going to live on natural grass? Just thinking at it that, that, that way. It sound, the first one sounds like you're already in a, uh, you know, a nursing home about to die off. <clears throat> and the second one is like, oh, okay, in, definitely interesting. You know? And it sounds right also. It sounds like the right choice to make. Just saying, I've got a reptile or, or any kind of other animal that we're talking about in that world, it wants nature. It, you know, it wants as much of nature as it can get, even if those, even if that nature is an imitated nature, it wants the conditions that nature supplies to it, you know, and that means a clean, good, healthy life, whatever the sun may be, whether it's a light or the sun, you know, whatever the soil may be, it's probably happier, if we're honest, it's probably a, a happier environment for that animal being free, if it wasn't in that cage, I'm not fighting that, I'm not, I'm not trying to say it, I'm just saying what if you brought that nature world into that into that little cage he has to live in? You're going to bring a lot more happiness to that little animal. You know, you're going to bring healthiness. You're going to bring the world to that animal, you know. And again, if you got a dog even, if your dog, I had a dog die last year and I was sad for about three days, you know, just like, ah, that hurts. You have an animal. It's there. It's part of you. Well, you know, whether it's a big old snake or whatever it may be. I don't know if you feel that way about all your all your isopods brian but maybe you have named a few and you got one or two that's your friend my point being is that your pets become your friends your pets become like a dang kid to you if you don't have kids then you do want to take care of them and you want to supply you know if you're a decent person you want to supply them a nice life and like marco said man bring nature into that little aquarium or that little that terrarium i should say and uh that could be something neat to do i think to uh especially like iguanas chameleons and uh, uh bearded dragons when they do just have the putt putt grass or the paper towel they usually roam back and forth and so i'll be honest man it seems like a lot of people that don't take don't take it out after like one or two defecations so you have multiple defecations on this putt putt grass paper towel and the animals walking back and forth on it so the disease just the, the overall health uh that seems to be kind of like the standard to me is gross. Like I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to smell the defecation. I certainly want to, I mean, it's right here next to me in my office and I never smell that anymore because of the IMOs and stuff that I purchased and thrown in there. I got, you know, probably 15 different isopods that I play around with in there. But that fact of removing the, the defecation for me alone uh, is something that I think a lot more people, once they realize that that's possible, because uh, it sounds too good to be true at first, same way living soil sounded too good to be true uh, by reusing your soil. Like when people are buying Fox Farm and kind of those early soil bags, uh, when people try to reuse that soil, they just didn't have that A to Z concept. And I think it's the same thing in the reptile space. It's just not enough people know from A to Z that it actually works. Uh, so that's obviously where you know we come from. Mm -hmm. lots to think about i see a few people in the chat say they've been um kind of already doing that kind of stuff and that's pretty cool um organic roots i had to check out his ig and see that because yeah i mean it, it makes sense and if you kind of got that it's probably you know it would take a grower to kind of bridge that right a grower and a reptile person to kind of bridge that yeah, um, awesome. yeah makes the most sense <clears throat> yeah start growing start growing big living soil beds with cannabis and you have you know like you say uh, arthur po uh, uh, you have how do you say i don't want to say roly poly because i feel like that's disrespectful although that's what i said as a kid <laughs> that's arthropods. It, <laughs> isopods that's it isopod uh, i never freaking can say the right word anyway isopods i don't want to be respectful to the isopod um, well they call them woodlouse over in, in uh uk is that yeah. what they call it woodlouse yeah, i like woodlouse. isopod better yeah, me I like too. Really I love isopod. Best, but I think that that's kind of a bad name. Shouldn't say. You should show respect to the isopod. <clears throat> but uh, dang it, forgot what we were talking about, man. Anyway, the IMO three. I think is our point ultimately, and all this talk is this is what IMO three can help you with. Actually, bringing microbes into an area. Like I said, it's the carrier, and the IMO three, the Bokashis, all kinds. There are all kinds of options in this reptile world. That again, nature layers it just because under here the microbes are eating, and right here is just a cover for them. So some taking a poop, 
it'll and then layering something on top of it like a bokashi or a little bit of imo3 it's just going to consume it quickly and go, it should go away fast so yeah and i guess one final thought on that the the in my opinion the springtails and then i've personally seen with baby isopods known as man k the man k are kind of like programmed if you will to eat manure from the adults so when you add the isopods and you use them as a food source those uh, babies and juveniles are constantly eating that manure as well so i personally like to use that's the awesome. porcelio lavis yeah orange if you're going to use that in cannabis that's probably like the, the, the best one that's out there there's a variety of other ones for reptile spaces but this is new frontier i think and and you guys building these imos i think will be the cherry on top for a lot of people in the reptile space so you know, continue to build up your acorn piles and all that kind of stuff because the time is coming at some point where I think a lot of people are going to be wanting to use this to improve uh, not only their skill sets, but improve the life of, of their reptiles and maybe improve the life of their family by not having it smell like mostly pee is what a, what a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. Not urea. ammonia, right? <clears throat> ammonia, oh, yeah. urea. Yeah. Yeah. Junk. yeah yeah all right well good good little rant a sidebar on the uh reptile world that's that's a lot of uh room to grow there man for sure yeah it's definitely needed mm -hmm. so do you guys mind since we kind of are talking about manures so the imo5 when you're, when you're getting to that level uh some people are now again playing around with a bunch of different manures and um uh, and, and kind of experimenting with that kind of stuff when I first was trying to understand this, I didn't realize that when you said frass and, and uh, worm compost or worm castings, I mean, uh, that, that you were basically saying poop, frass, all that kind of stuff. So when you're talking manures uh, to stay safe, why don't we start off with the cold manures? And then what do you guys think about some of the what's considered hot manures for IMO5? I'm getting some boxes out here. And I'm going to show you real quick. So this is, there we go. That, let's see, this is IMO5, I believe. Yeah. This right here is IMO4. This is what I grow in right here. You can see that stuff. Let's see. There we go. But this is IMO4. This is IMO3 plus my compost. Right, and you can you can see it's kind of brownie. -y. It kind of falls apart in chunks, right? Boop. So that's a good IMO four. Um, I took my IMO three, all that stuff, ground it up, made IMO three. I mixed it with my compost. That's IMO four. That's what I grow in. And then what I did was I added, uh, I used chicken manure for my IMO five this time. But I've got chicken manure, I've got quail manure, rabbit, and and sheep. Uh, manure. I got bags of that out behind my yard back there that I, I bartered from a homesteader here in the Tulsa area. This is IMO5 right here, and it's IMO4 with chicken manure added. As you can see, again, beautiful hyphies all in there. It's like a nice brownie chunk, but that right there is what a garden wants. When your garden has put out all the tomatoes and cucumbers and okra and everything that you wanted that summer and you picked it all and you ate it that took all the nutrient out into your put it into your body that imo5 is really good to replenish your garden with needed nitrogen because that chicken manure has a lot of nitrogen in it the i the compost it has a lot of nutrient in it also plus biology the IMO3 has a ton of biology in it, plus carbohydrates and carbon. So, you know, once you get to that IMO5 level, that is some powerful stuff. That uh, it And it takes a while to make. It's a process. You, you know, you just don't just mix it up and it's ready. Like, you want to cook it. You're trying to you're trying to make that environment a good environment so that microbes will, will multiply and, and you'll have, you know, a highly inoculated material once again, but you've added a ton of nitrogen. Uh, to the material so that you are now going to you're going to spread that out over your garden or your no-till spots just to resupply the nutrients not only that you're getting all the microbiology that comes with it not only that you're getting the organic material that is so valuable and important to get into your to your growing areas 
So IMO5 is just, the, I, I, you can use all kinds of manure. I use chicken manure. However, guys, my chicken manure, it broke down for eight months. It was in, sitting in sacks uh, behind my fence, just getting rained on and just sitting there breaking down so it's not so hot and that urea in there isn't, isn't so hot. It's had time to break down through the, what is it, the ammonia forms and on into a nitrate or a nitrite. I don't know, guys. I'm learning all this stuff right now. But the IMO5 will have that good broken down chicken manure lots of lots of nitrogen you can use you know if you use chicken manure you need to let it break down for a while because chickens pee and poop in the same spot and so their manure has lots of urine in it whereas a rabbit will poop and then you know pee from different spots and you can use that manure you can use the rabbit manure immediately <clears throat> so there are some animals manure that you can use immediately some animal manures, manures that need to need to break down for just a little bit because they got a lot of you basically it's urea in them i'm just sure there might be other animals that have other stuff that that could be toxic but the basic farm animals around here you know you can you can use probably any i've never used a horse manure i've never used a cow manure i've only used the little the little animals i uh chicken rabbit and quail are the only manures that i have used to make an imo5 there you go um some of them larger animals the farm animals you got to watch though you know the worming of the animals and things like that dewormers can diminish your microbes so you wouldn't want to you know use something that was wormed up uh dewormed to do that but um another one is um <clears throat> if you want to you know don't want to use an actual animal manure for um I've done this before is I'll take comfrey almost JLF style. Let's let it soak and get nasty and funky and then um, use that as my I, as my manure. <clears throat> so, you know, that IMO4 an equal weight of that manure um, will give you your IMO5. So you can use things like comfrey and different plants to break down to kind of get that fertilizer uh, component if you don't want, you know, the kind of the animal um, poop. But, yeah, I use rabbit love my rabbits cold manure there's a few animals that are cold manure meaning like plant roots won't burn um from all the things that um kevin was mentioning and uh, llamas uh, uh, alpaca uh, uh, rabbit and a couple others but you know just be careful with your manures man especially when you're using some larger animals and um you know stick with your principles you know let things go through the process for the right amount of times and and that kind of thing and um that way you just, you know, keep everything growing positive, beneficial microbes without having to worry about growing a bucket full of pathogens. You know what I mean? No, yeah, the, the principle, the principle is to use grass eaters. Like don't, don't use a dog manure or somebody, some animal is going to be eating meat and stuff like that. Those are just a whole new class of microbiology that, you know, we don't really use in the plant world. So the, again, in the Judam world is plants have what plants need. So if you got an animal that's only eating plants, they are processing the plant down. They're squeezing out some of the nutrients, but then they're they're passing it out into just a new form. Still lots of nutrients. Um, but it went blank again. Go ahead, guys. Dang it. Hey, uh, Marco, I wanted to ask, I mean, now that I think it's been like over a year, you've been doing the, the bunny farming, basically creating these little poop factories. Uh, I had one and enjoyed it, <laughs> the the time and the experience. Uh, I thought it, I I really I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I can't imagine having my own piece of land where you have several of them uh, kind of running around. And I, I was hoping you could kind of share some insights from that bunny farming and uh, some of the pros and cons. And chicken, right? I mean, you you have put in all kinds of little animal traps in there. Now you probably have lots of access to different types of manure. Oh yeah, yeah. I got the birds, got the um, rabbits, and now and basically the rabbits. I got them. They're meat rabbits. Um, saved them from slaughter. My buddy um, B W Ed raises meat rabbits. So I told him me some that you were gonna call. They're actually a show variety, so he shows them, and they're bred for meat. <clears throat> but they're um, from my area, um, so I wanted a rabbit that an animal. When I when you raise animals, you want just like a plant. You want a plant that grows for you. You know, and the, and then sure you're gonna get an animal or a plant that grows from you is kind of get one that's from your area. So these were all bred here. They live outdoors in the winter, and um, they're cool, man. Rabbits are really easy. Um, you know, you just have to make sure 
like we were talking about earlier, um, because they're so easy, you know, you don't want to neglect them. You know what I mean? You still want to tend to them. You still, you know, want to change their bedding. Um, there are a lot of, in the summer, there's not much with bedding because it's hot. You know what I mean? In the winter, you know, every couple of times a week, I'll pump up their bedding when it gets real cold. Um, but nothing, nothing difficult, man. Water every day, pellets, um, organic pellets. And then I grow different grasses to feed them. You know, I grow orchard grass and then I grow, um, the sorghum. They have some of that as well. And then I got all kinds of native shit growing around and, um, I'll put a pin up around some a bunch of native grasses and I'll put them in there and then I'll let them show me what they like, you know, and then I'll start saying, oh, I see they like that or they, you know, oh, no, they stay away from that. And so just stuff like that, man, it's been really great. Just, you know, learning them and, um, the, you know, the husbandry of it, if you will. Um, if push came to shove, you know, it wouldn't take much to get a male rabbit. And now you can have more rabbits than you want, you know, or you can have plenty of rabbits to be eating off of if that's something that, that I had to do. But for right now, just rolling with the four females and uh, they've been real chill, real easy to work with. And they do poop every day. <laughs> And then what about your chickens? I mean, yeah. you said all how that. Egg, how many eggs you get? I saw you got a double egg one time. Yeah, well, right now I'm only I'm only only two are laying right now. So I started out with six this year. I wanted to have I wanted to get four, you know, and ended up with um three because I had a mishap right around the first day going in. I found out my my coop wasn't all the way secure, so something got in there and killed a couple. So I got three. Um, they just started laying not too long ago, and now I'm getting two every day right now. And um, a lot like a lot of the old timers around here, they say, you know, once the chicken's feet get cold, they'll stop laying. And so what I do is part of my living floor is that living floor holds heat. You know what I mean? So in their coop and in their run, you put your hand down in there. It's it's way warmer than ambient. Like it may be 40, 50 degrees outside, but it's like 80, 90 degrees down in there. And um, so that's part of it, too, is just keeping that warmth in. And then when it gets really cold. I could just wrap the entire thing in a tarp and now the heat from the living floor um, will help just keep everything warm. So I'm hoping, man, my goal, if I can just keep eggs going all year, uh, all this fall, because really they should have stopped. So this is all just a bonus. So if I can keep them laying during the winter and keeping that floor warm, you know, I feel like I did really good um, as far as long term, you know, repeating that next year and doing more and getting better at it. So will a chicken keep laying eggs uh, if their feet are warm? If it's warm weather, chicken lay the whole time, or do they ever have a little pause in their egg laying? No, they will. If you if they're growing in a warm climate, they'll just lay all year. I mean, sometimes they say lighting, might low light hours can stop you know, shorten their laying or, or slow them down. Yeah. Um, but if all, I can, you know, I, know, I mean, yeah. I know chickens. You know, in the winter time, like you said, they're they're not going to do as much. But I didn't know if like com if you if you in artificially kept those temperatures high and the sun warm. You know, if they're just pumping out eggs all year long. That's, yeah, just like a chicken, chicken house. Eggs. Well, you yeah, know, just exactly. like a chicken house, they keep them hot, and then they then they got that lighting in there, and they just keep laying. Makes sense. Yeah, it's wild. I didn't even. I mean, things I didn't know. Like a chicken has all the eggs already in it right now. Like in these breed that I have, have about 250 to 300 eggs in them, each one. Um, you know what I mean? That's exactly. pretty, um, it's pretty wild to think about it like that. And they're starting out. The eggs are kind of small now still, but I mean, I expect they're going to be some big layers. And what I've learned from having just these few egg layers is next year, because these, I mean, they grew fast, man. I mean, it, wasn't, it didn't take long for me to be seeing them as like, damn, bro, you got drumsticks on you. You know, I mean, you're, you're a real chicken here. So my goal is for next year, I'm going to do another run with just meat birds, um, fast growing meat birds and, and try to do maybe 20. And then at the end of the growing season, be able to have 20 birds to put in my freezer or share with some people and just slowly kind of building up how much my little bit of land produces you know what i mean because i'm nowhere near maxed out i'm just getting started you know when you look around there's so much square footage that could be growing something or doing something else beneficial so yeah the birds and the and the, and the rabbits have been key right now my next one i would like to get 
inspired by uh, nature's always right uh, bro steven i want to get some uh, like dwarf goats or maybe some smaller variety of sheep maybe just about four just enough to go put in a pen and keep shit mowed down and keep little areas tightened down kind of like he's doing a miniature version of that so fun stuff man and it all yeah, starts you with like work into your property yeah. uh, <clears throat> marco you have that thing is constantly transforming which is kind of what organics is right it's like whatever you're learning every time you do something you're learning a new thing about your environment and how it works and you're adjusting accordingly and it, it's fun to watch you homestead that place up <clears throat> i would and when i have less kids around i'll probably do more homesteading but the that is such a thing for kids to get in i have friends that are homesteaders that do have a lot of kids but their kids participate in everything and their kids get in everything and I just don't have the patience right now for my kids to destroy my hard work and me take it very well. Uh, so when my kids get a little bit older, I'll be having some chickens and things like that back on back on my property. I'm hoping anyway. Yeah, and it's cool now, man, because now I'm just I'm just I feel like this is next grocery trip. I might not have to buy eggs. Like you know, that's a milestone. The first time I might not have to buy eggs because, um, and that, that's cool. You know, it's just a small thing, but. It's one step, you know, it's just one. You know how many eggs we all eat in the world. And so shit, if you can eat an egg every day that or eggs every day that are super clean and don't have to worry about anything, that's just one more thing I don't have to worry about, you know. That's right. And PSL, see, <clears throat> you get those free eggs every day. And I, I have a lady that I get my chicken manure from. She's actually in my neighborhood right here. And she brings us. she's still bringing us some eggs. But I I send her a little bit of the Bokashi. I tell her how to spray the EM1 all over, you know, her chicken beds or spray some labs on there and just give her things to be like, listen, this is going to help the stink because eventually I get that chicken manure right back to me. So I'm I'm throwing her all kinds of stuff to be like, listen, let's break it down. You know, let's get it, all it. down fast and it's a good little right. barter thing going on. I like that, man. You're preloading it with the micro with your microbes that you want back on your place anyway. That's pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. There was a uh, a homesteader that was showing. I believe they went to like uh, a couple of their grocery stores, so kind of like your your basic grocery store, and just got the cheap eggs. Went and got the pasture raised eggs, and then was showing their eggs that they had from their own chickens. And all they did was crack open the eggs and show the color of the yolk. And it is a definite difference. Same thing with like your concentrates sometimes. Like if you're talking quality and then you're talking, all right, I need a couple things to check off the box to say that this is obviously a quality egg. I think the actual coloring of the egg, once you see like a homesteader's chicken egg compared to, you know, a cheap, uh, for me back in the day would have been like food lion or something. That's probably the cheapest of the cheap eggs. Uh, and what that color actually looks like it's pretty eye-opening, uh, and I think when you're talking relatively just a couple dollars to get the the healthy eggs to, to build protein and take care of your body, especially if you're feeding mm -hmm. five children over there, uh, you know, or, or taking care of a, a piece of land, Marco, uh, there's a definite um, surplus that starts to take hold. And I think when we were talking eggs, uh, I'm sorry, when we were talking acorns and the magic of that, we're on a whole nother level here when you start talking about an egg. Like a lot of people even would consider that a perfect food. Mm -hmm. uh, homesteaders have that because you can live off those eggs and they know that it's a, a consistent, it sounds like unless you know it gets cold, it's a consistent food so source every single day. Yeah. What's up, Mackie? I see you out there. Mm -hmm. Hi on home, bro. Um, yeah, but you know, another thing, guys, the fucking shells on my eggs are so hard. Like when I crack I go to crack them. I got to hit them like twice, you know, like extra hard. I've dropped these eggs when I was out on the farm. I've dropped one and it just bounced, you know, like, and I attribute that to all the black soldier fly they get. Um, That's another thing. Like the reason I can do chickens and my egg cost is, is, is like almost nothing is because I raised all those black soldier fly at easy, you know, nothing hard about it. Just set up a bin. Um, they also colonize my floor, their floor. So because I use wheat bran, and when you get wheat bran wet, the black, black soldier flies go crazy, so they come to it. And so now the birds realize, damn, just scratch the floor. I eat right out the floor. 
you know, and so that's what's that's what's really special, man, when I see them eating. And be about it farms, man. You're right, honeybees. I do want to get honeybees at a um because I'm gonna, you know, grow plenty of pollinator plants. Honeybees is another one that we can go, you know, we can do. I got a my uh, good friends growing them down in Georgia, and it's not hard to do, you know, just get the what? knowledge. Yeah. Well, and talk about like uh, leaving your kind of stamp on, on life, like when you when you pass on, if you can start to build up bee colonies where there's just more and more found in nature, that's I think one of the more paramount things uh, a human being could do with their piece of land, uh, because of the way that like with the almond trees, they actually truck these bees from one state to the other, and I, like almost sounds like nonsense now. Like I didn't realize that farming almonds alone the amount of water that's trucked in and the amount of bees that are trucked in when people say oh i drink almond milk to save the environment and always you hear that kind of stuff uh, i think they're misinformed on what it really actually takes to grow almond trees these days you know i want to say something the marco's being like you know i got two eggs today <clears throat> that's a milestone and two eggs is a milestone. That's a big freaking deal because we can put it in the, in one sense, you're like, yeah, it's two eggs. So what? You should have got four or six or whatever. You know, you could always do better. <clears throat> you can, you can be very critical about it, but that's not the mindset that he has or that we have here. It's an organic mindset. Is that, sorry, is that you did something. And it took a process, an organic process, but you started the thing, you built it, and now you're getting a reward back from it. And it's just a thing that's going to keep on working and keep on working and returning, and basically it's going to be a closed-loop system. And you have a few more of those things happening. And But guys, before you know it, you, you're starting to save yourself some finances. You're starting to save yourself some time. You're not only saving finances, you're saving your time of having to go to the store to get things and come back. And moreover, in my world, you're being mentally healthy. <clears throat> you are, you're, you're participating in your own health, right? You're doing things that are returning for you. One part of a mature person is knowing, is understanding short-term sacrifices for long-term gain. That I'm going to freaking work my butt off. I'm going to work my butt off one winter, one summer, one year, preparing something, knowing that for the years behind it, it's going to reward me back. But I have to do the hard work up front. And, and that's the mindset of being, of being sufficient for yourself, of being able to be like, you know what? If I have to grow my own food, I'm going to dang have a dang good shot at doing it because I prepared myself in certain ways. I'm understanding how soils work. I'm understanding how grow, growing works. But <clears throat> I'm providing for me. I'm providing for my family. I'm, I'm, I'm on a road to take care of myself and not have other people take care of me doesn't mean i don't need people i certainly do but i can at least say boys my to my boys boys this is how we're going to live this is how you're going to provide for yourself too if, if it hits the fan we are going to be able to do this and that's a bigger thing than just two eggs but the two eggs brings all of that with it you know people always asking me well what about the stuff you get out of the dumpster <clears throat> what about the pesticides dude i don't know I can only go with the mindset I have, a regenerative organic mindset that I'm going to use what's in front of me. And thankfully, microbiology will rehabilitate a lot of things, right? It will regenerate a lot of new life into old bad soils if I got bad fruit that's been sprayed with pesticides or something like that. The bigger point is, is that I am participating in something bigger than me, that Mother Nature is here. And if I kind of participate with Mother Nature, she starts to work with me too, because I'm living in her environment. I'm living in her office space. And if I can tap into what she does, it's a wonderful life and it brings you mental health. And as I always say, you can break open those mental loops that you keep on doing and going through by learning to close organic loops. When you get participating in Mother Nature and you learn how to recycle things and how it works and that there's a big life system that is constantly going on, you become a more appreciative person. You become a thankful person. It changes you from the inside and the out. And that's what his two eggs did. And that, I want to emphasize what that really means when he says it was a milestone. It's a big deal. Good job, Marco. Yes, sir. Big deal. Yes, sir. Well said, bro. It's, it's and it's mo it's all mindset. You 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 guys know it. Like somebody, 
you know, it's how you look at things. Like, you, you ever know somebody that says, if you say something good, like, well, it must be nice. You know, like, well, fuck, yeah, it is nice. But when they say that, they're not really happy for you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's about how you look at things. Like, damn, I'm happy my boy got a you know big old house or whatever. Damn, I know somebody that got a big, nice house. Or I know somebody, a good, close person of mine, a friend of mine that has something really nice. Like, look at that as a positive. I'm glad they got that. And when you do that, like you said, like Kevin said, it'll change your whole outlook on everything. Your whole positivity starts going in the right direction and you, and you get out of kind of a negativity um looking at shit in a negative light it kind of makes everything you do kind of you know negative so you know, mindset is key we always say one of the principles that cho has and, and i like too is you know have an open mind you know when you're doing this stuff you know open mind it means like you said i don't know i'm you know i'm assuming this thing isn't loaded down sprayed down with pesticides it may be you got to kind of trust the process. You feel like the microbiology are good at breaking down pesticides, only, you know, even heavy metals in some cases. So you kind of got to work the process. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with let, just throwing stuff in a pile on your property. Pile it up. Let it sit there for months. Then use it. You know, let Mother Nature kind of work with it. And if you see mushrooms growing in it, it tells you it's another sign. Mushrooms aren't going to grow where shit ain't right. Somebody that grows mushrooms told me that just the fact that the mushroom grew in that spawn in that bag means that it was legit, means that it was good. So if a mushroom didn't grow, you had something bad in there. So if, when you see that in your pot on your land and piles start growing mushrooms and stuff, then now you can say, all right, that's kind of worked itself out. Now let me use that pile. You know, you don't always have to use everything, you know, fresh either. A little right. rambling there, but you know what I'm saying. Well, you're saying what I, I've heard from some old heads too, Marco, that, okay, so now you have fruiting bodies of mushrooms and then they're creating that diversity, right? For, for this individual, they were saying, okay, this is when I can start to look back and all right, I'm going to start to break uh, and, and remove a lot of the inputs that I've been adding because these fungal networks keep growing and spreading and things are improving month after month. I'm, well, I'm basically as close as I start to, as I can be to start to bring back, uh, the, I'm not saying this correctly, basically trying to get no, to I'm uh, water I'm only. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. Water only is in, in this gentleman's opinion is only going to be achieved for the heavy feeder of cannabis. When you have the fungal aspects that are up there at the same level as the bacterial aspects. That's what I was trying to say. That makes a lot of sense. And that's also your populations in your soil too. You know, even like we said, adding that uh, that IMO, building up those microbes that you also can't see, you know. And so, yeah, I, I agree with that 100 percent. All that's nutrient cycling. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot I mean, of old heads were doing this. They just didn't, I guess, use that same verbiage. But it, it's gone from kind of the at least in Denver, it's gone from people kind of growing this way or at least the people more kind of in a uh, like a mountain mindset that want to get away from everybody. And then here in Denver for a long time, because it was indoors, everything was hydroponic. A lot of rock wool in those early days. People said hydro was the best. I mean, there was even this company, Dro, that was super popular. Hydro, you know, everything's so cool in Denver. Uh, and now it's it's flipped back, in, except for some of the bigger, like, well-funded brands where the <clears throat> really small mom and pops, this is the only way that they see a future in, in farming cannabis is trying to find the learn it themselves or find a grower that understands how to grow in this manner so that things are improving year after year. Because in Denver, that is, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would imagine it's 98, 99% of them, uh, the facility degrades over time with just the overall pest pressures, the morale of the team itself, all of those things come into play, I think, on a, on a much heavier scale than a lot of people give it credit to except for the people that are more in the living soil crowd that that might believe in more of that as the metaphysical aspects of farming cannabis. Uh, I think there's obviously something to that. And when the team isn't on board and everyone's infighting, I've personally seen the plants go from strong vigor, uh, praying leaves is what we used to call that, to just slumped over plants within a matter of days 
because of the, in my, I guess my opinion, the, the hate, hateful vibrations that were going on at the time. Uh, so there's a lot to that as well. And I think uh, a lot of people just gloss over that. Uh, they, they think it's probably uh, some other deficiency or whatever. But I, I think the vibrations of, of just being a human being around plants can dramatically affect a large commercial facility and can obviously dramatically affect a small tank grow. Amen to that. I agree 100%. That, yeah, that's if, you're your... there, if you're out there and you're a, <clears throat> if you are a, you know, a head cultivator, or you're kind of a, in charge of the place, any business that you're in, guys, I'm not, you know, well, I won't go there yet, but if you're the leader, you are the number one encourager. You're the number one cheerleader. You don't have the bad day. You put your bad day to the side. You understand that other people have bad days and you help them through it because you are relying on them to get the job done. And if they can't get the job done, then guess who's got to do it? You do, owner man. So all the people that are underneath you, dude, the first thing you're doing is praising their hard work. And I want to tell you something. You can straight up lie to a lazy person and make them a hard worker. I've had people work with me before, <clears throat> and I know the kind of person they are. And you're like, you just know that they don't want to do the job. But the first thing you walk up to them and say, anytime you see them do anything, walk up and say, man, you always work so hard. I really appreciate your hard work, dude. Good job. I want you to keep it up. I'm proud of you. You know, way to go. Walk on. Let me tell you what you have done. You have set the bar in his head at where he thinks you think he is. He now thinks that you think he's a good worker and he always is here on time and he works hard and he has a reputation of a hard worker. And what you've done is you set a bar up in his mind that he now is going to try to meet when he sees you all the time because he knows that's what you think of that because he knows that's what you think of him. If, if it's all working here. So, encouraging a lazy dude and straight up lying to somebody saying, dude, you're a hard worker. I appreciate you. You'll, I promise you when you're around, he'll start working because you encouraged him. That's all you did. You set a bar of, of decency on him. Like, dude, you're a good guy. Come on, keep on working. I appreciate you. And man, that's a leadership move. That's all it is. And you would think, well, yeah, he's probably a lazy person. It's not going to work. No, 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 no. The skill is in the owner. The skill is in you, the leader. The skill is in you to make him be a good worker. It's not that it's not that he's not good enough to be a good worker. The, the thing is, are you a good enough leader to make him a good worker? And that's a challenge as a leader, as a person who's coming in on the top saying, guys, I want everybody here to be an A. I want you all to be as passionate about it as I am, and I'm going to let you just go on your own and do whatever you can do, and I'm going to cheer you on. You know, why did I hire you anyway if I'm not going to just let you go and do what I hired you to do? So as a leader, man, be the cheerleader. Be the encourager. Come in, set the tone. Come in, say, hey, guys, we're going to have a good day. Things are going to happen, aren't they? We get it. But we're not going to nag at each other. We're going to fight each other because that negativity crap, I can't go home and sleep well when we do that stuff. So mouth shut. When things get hard, we all just say something like, good. It's going to make us better. Let's go in here and knock it out. But, you know, let me tell you something. As a leader also, when when things do hit the fan and you're actually in the moment of having to practice what you preach, it is tough to be the person who says, guys, I understand we got a, we got a problem, but we are going to get through it, and I'm going to lead us through, guys. Don't worry. That's a tough thing to say in the heat of the moment. But, guys, people want to hear that so bad, so desperately bad. And if you are the leader in that moment, you know, it's not a time for crybabies. Leaders have to put the tears aside and they have to say, man, I got to put my emotions aside and I have to lead you. Here's what we've got to do. We can do this, you know. So I, I want to encourage you if you are the head of your grow out there, if you're ahead of any business, don't be a douchebag. Don't be a douchebag, man. <clears throat> if you're the boss, be cool. Be, these people are showing up and they're working with you, man. They probably don't want to be there, but dude, you guys, you as the leader, you can set the tone. I've told Brian this before. You all need to get a book. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It will change your life. It, it really will. It will give you wisdom beyond your years, no matter what age you're at. It's going to give you things that are going to help you out in your business world. If you're an entrepreneur, pretty much like all three of us guys are, if you're entrepreneurial in your mindset, 
you got to learn how to work with other people. You got to learn how to communicate, connect. You got to learn how to be able to be a hub and say, I know that guy's got it or she's got it. And uh, that's what a good leader is. And man, that book is valuable. But I just went off a little bit because, guys, that's what I got my doctorate in is leadership, understanding how to make two people who totally disagree come together, have a plan, and we both can move forward and we both can benefit from that. So yeah, that's that's why I'm passionate on this stuff because it can happen. It, we really can happen. And in the world we live in now, my goodness, people don't see each other anymore. We see political sides. That's all we see. And if you if you're on that side, then I have to hate you. It's like God, we have lost. We've really lost a mental health level. We've skipped past discussion, and we've skipped past the ability to win somebody to your side. Right? It's the ability to get somebody to say yes without them even knowing they said yes. Just having a way with a person to be like, listen, we can get along. We can communicate. We can move forward, and we don't have to yell at each other. That's a gift, y'all. And if you're a leader, you you want to you want that gift. Yeah, I can't uh, echo enough of that that book. I think if you're in charge of a grow, um, it's a Dale Carnegie book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Uh, a lot of people would recommend that book, but it is, you know, when you're a head grower and you're kind of, it's almost like, or from my experience, people kind of go two ways. They're either all about them or they're more of like an NFL style where it's like, all right, I play this role. But at the same time, I'm teaching you. You get to learn firsthand. I'm in the trenches. You're getting firsthand high level knowledge because you're here with me as the assistant growers. And when I've seen people do that, when the tough times come, that side of things rallies behind the head grower. When the when the suits come in and want to fire somebody at the head grower level, the assistants rally around them. Hey, man. If you do that, the wheels are going to fall off. We don't have the skill sets yet. This person needs to be here. They're the head chef, if you will, and we're the sous chefs. We're on the flip side of that. When the head grower is constantly either taking credit, uh, we used to joke that was like the Steve Jobs approach, right? When a ton of people are working and, and only one person is taking credit for all of the work that's being done, there's a lot of resentment that start to be built. So when you yeah. take that approach as a leader and the hard times come, I promise you the people that are around you, those assistant growers aren't going to do anything to help you because they don't feel like you've ever done that for them either. And there's a dramatic difference in system change and all of that. And I think, it, you know, things rot from the head up, right? Or head down. And I think that happens uh, time and time again in these large grows where it really truly is if this person can lead and have people buy into the system same way with like elite football and all that kind of stuff you have to have everybody buying into the program for it to work and that's why i don't know maybe why i love sports so much is because it is hard at least at the nfl level for everybody to buy into certain programs but once everybody's clicking on all cylinders uh that's why you see that these mega commercial facilities can be run by just three four five highly skilled uh growers where in the synthetic world, you're talking probably 15 to 20 employees are the standard. And, and that's how they kind of run these businesses. So living soil from a labor standpoint, I think is the big thing that, that uh, the suits never listen on, unless they're more of like a CPA style. Just the labor alone could be uh, whether you are profitable or not, let alone uh, how much it costs to farm cannabis, just by having five people do it instead of 15. <clears throat> yeah. You know, the one thing I took from that book, or the one thing that always sticks out in my mind, and the older I get, the now I'm like, did I take it from that book? But it has to be from that book is the value of recognizing somebody else's efforts, recognizing somebody else's hard work, just saying to somebody, wow, good job, dude. That was really good. Just recognizing their hard work. Because when, you know, when Marco post those pictures behind him of um, the magnolias and the bulbs that, that and they look you know like they've been they got bacteria all over them and they look awesome <clears throat> you know that took time that took work and for me it was just a quick picture of ooh, that's nice look at those awesome and i skipped past the dude that did all the work right that's why it's like look at that marco those things look fantastic job marco that's really cool 
you know, it's a whole new way to say it and a whole new way to encourage Marco to continue to be awesome. So if, if he continues to be awesome, I'm going to continue to learn more. So the more I make Marco better and the more I make Marco feel like, dude, you are good at what you do. And you are, Marco. But the more I just tell a good guy he's you are really too. good, I'm going to sit back and watch him and, and get to reap the benefits of him being awesome. And all I'm doing is just keeps doing this. So if you have people who work with you or work for you or under you or do anything for you, first thing you need to do is recognize their hard work. Say, good job. I know that probably took a lot of time. Probably took you away from your family some. Uh, I appreciate you spending that time benefiting me. Thank you very much. That means a ton to people, and you will win a friend for life, recognizing other people's hard work. Yeah, I've definitely seen that uh, in like groups before where the, the company didn't have the money to basically give them a raise. So instead of telling them that, they started providing food for them a couple times a week. So it was almost like kicking the can down the road, but they were thinking outside the box to try to keep the company morale high. Um, and again, that's why I even learned too, uh, through that little experiment, at first we were buying the crew pizza. And we noticed like as two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock started to come on, the production uh, value of it, all of the trimmer employees went down dramatically. So that's when we started buying like Panera and salads and stuff that people would eat that for lunch. And we noticed that the, the production of the crew stayed higher when we didn't give them the heavy, greasy foods. So there's so many things, I think, to learn uh, when you're farming on a commercial level. And, uh, you know, I guess the, the real hindsight of it all is that once you're there, it's not as glitz and glamorous as everybody thinks it is. So that's why I encourage you guys to get good at a soil skill set, maybe create your own IMO in your little local town. And then monetize that skill set for yourself because the cannabis lifestyle on the commercial level, it it's very rough, especially if you have all your eggs in one basket kind of thing. But if you have the ability to create soil, um, you can create obviously your own plants, but then find other things. And for me personally, that's how I felt like I've been able to justify learning cannabis and then being able to kind of walk away and, and just want to give back to others uh, because it's very hard for the average person especially self-funded uh, to even be picked to grow commercial cannabis, or if you have the money to fund that, to be able to compete when they change things constantly. So that's just a warning to the, the you know, you want to be an informed uh, person. And I think a lot of people still in these newer states that are popping on still see it as like glitz and glamor behind the scenes of, of farming cannabis. And unfortunately that is very rare. Uh, so you'd either be working for somebody that gets exactly what uh, Kevin's talking about. You know, I, another book that I like, I guess if we're getting on that is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outlier. He talks about how all these famous people, the one thing in common that the, the, all these people have is something called the 10,000 hour rule. Is that a long time? Hell yeah. You're talking years and years and years to achieve that. But uh, it's backed by this gentleman's data that if you do achieve that 10,000 hours within your lifetime, you could master pretty much anything. So there is there is hope that you can be 40, I, I'm 41 years old trying to master isopods. But the fact that I know that I can put in, you know, at least eight, eight hours a day allows me to realize that eventually I'm gonna get to that uh, 10,000 hours. And luckily my wife's doing the same thing. So I don't really know how that works in life and all that, but 16 hours a day has gotta be something to it when two people are putting in that amount of time. So for people out there that wanna do this with their spouse or, or you know, maybe this is your own little kind of getaway. I don't think I don't think age ever matters with this kind of stuff, with making your own IMOs, with building soil systems. You could be 60 years old and be able to master this within a few years. Uh, where with cannabis, I think that's a young man's game, to be honest, uh, it, it, on, on the commercial level. Uh, the body is, or at least my body, uh, is 40 years old. I can't imagine doing that for 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week as my career no, nothing's going to change. That's just how I take care of my family. I think most people's bodies would break down above probably 35. Body and mind, you know what I mean? That can be kind of mindless when that kind of work too. Um, that's why we always say whatever situation you're in, have that parallel passion. You know what I mean? I always ask guys, you know, in my, in my other 
you know, in, in my industry, you know, well, what's your passion? What do you do? What do you want to do? You know, what do you do? And, <clears throat> you know, some people have a passion. Some people really don't. Some people don't have anything extra outside of work that they do. And I, and, and I think that's sad, you know, but I, I try to make them reach deeper, you know, come on, man, it's something you like, you know, and they'll usually come up with something, but, you know, for me, pursue that passion do something you really enjoy like if you enjoy this sometimes you have to go you know work for the man you know for a little while to get you some money and figure it out until you can kind of really hit that passion but always keep that keep them both going you know and that, that's gonna be the key because at any moment you can take that branch off you may you may take a good branch in your in your you know career you know you may have to ride that for a while so you still keep that passion going but one day there'll be a point when you're ready to hop off that ride. And then when you got that passion um, going for you and, or that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit, that business mind mm -hmm. that, you know, doing things you love to do, if you have that all going for you, then, um, <clears throat> you know, to me, you'll be better off, you know, than to just be focused and putting all your eggs, especially in this other man's basket, the big corporation, the big flashy corporation, just because they're, you know, big brand, you know, I don't mean shit. They, they'll get rid of you, me, whoever else, just like that, because that machine's going to keep going regardless. Um, so don't put all your eggs into that. Keep a lot of your eggs into yourself, you know, into, you know, thinking about what you really want to do for yourself, because ultimately, whatever your career is and whoever you are, <clears throat> if you hit the lottery tomorrow, you're not going back there. You know, I mean, you might throw your fucking keys at the building or something, but nobody's going back to work unless you just ain't got no good sense. You know what I mean? You should already have something that you enjoy doing uh, and be ready to take that move if, if that was to happen. So. Yeah, exactly. Unless what you're doing is not considered work, right? <clears throat> that's there you go. Winning the lotto. Winning the lot. If I win the lotto, yeah. Well, I'm that's the passion. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to really, at my point in life right now, if I, if I did win the lottery, I would buy me a new car. Not a new one, but a good car. I should say that a good truck, <clears throat> and that would be it. Like I'll make my kids would be provided for, but we're not going to get into no big house. We're not changing anything. My joy comes from the hard work that I put into my little homestead right here, man. And if I have to up for it one day, I might have to, but I'm not. I'm not planning on it at all. You know, my hard work is right here. This is my passion. This is where I come to, and you know, this is what's solid. This is something in my life that gives it's an anchor point, right? That the, the organic lifestyle, the organic mindset, I always know it's there. Things, other things may come and go and stay, but there's always an anchor point in my life with this passion of, of just, you know, getting out in nature and making things out of making things out of Mother Nature. It's a passion and it will always be here. And like, like, like you said. If you did win the lotto, would you still do organics? Of course you would, Marco. You know you would because it's a passion. But you'd throw them keys at that at that cement job or whatever, or whatever yeah, yeah. the other job you have. You throw them at it immediately. But that's yeah, a passion for me too, though. But see that. But see, building big projects was a passion for me too. Like I really liked that, man. I liked that. You know, I worked on the Barclays Center. You know what I mean? You know, Lucas Oil Stadium. Right. You know what I mean? you know, 30 stories in Indianapolis. You know what I mean? I've been, I've got my mark, you know, when I drive places, well, my wife and I go to certain cities, a lot of times DC, Baltimore, Poynton, worked on that. Remember that, did that, you know, so that's all cool too, you know, and that's, that's provided me with the means to do a lot of things and have a, you know, have a, <clears throat> a good life. And I did, and I do love that. However, there's only so much of, you know, making millions of dollars for, you know, another company, you know, that, that really a man should do, you know, even though our company is employee owned, which is awesome. Um, you gotta take that. If you can make millions of dollars for that company, imagine what you can make for yourself, like Brian and his wife getting up eight hours every day only for themselves. So that's where I'm like, man, you never know, you know, where a passion could take off until you have the means to kind of be able to do that. And sometimes grinding in that concrete jungle for a little while, stacking your paper. Now we can hit our passion. You know, that may be the move. Just like there's different ways to do IMO. Life's the same way, man. There ain't no exact path. But what we know we don't want to do is, you know, 
do it the way the system wants work 35 years at this place die at your desk uh, or retire and then you get you know have a few years left of bullshit life you know you want to try to get out to that what they call retirement as soon as possible you know and that's where having that double passion Brian and Natasha, they go on, go on, go on, go on. Well, shit, eventually something's going to hit. Bam, it's going to take off and go even faster. You know, it's going to really propel things. And that's what sticking with it does. You know, if you don't stick with it, you never know, man. You could have stopped right when it was just about to break, but you stopped. You know, so you got to keep pushing. Yeah, man, I think um, a lot of people it sounds almost too good to be true to be able to even just pick your day. Uh, so the, making your own money is nice. Having the own, your own freedom to be an entrepreneur and, and pick out your day is something that I will try hopefully treasure for the rest of my life. And I want more people to find that for themselves. So there's something like Marco is saying, there's some kind of passion that you have. And if you are struggling for financial reasons, then you need to figure out that passion and monetize it. And if you are just kind of, you know, you've worked hard and you need to vote, money can't be the only thing in your life. And so I think when people do get to a certain mm -hmm. point and they have decent money, it's like, yeah, okay, now what? I thought I'd feel different. I thought there would be some kind of grand thing in my life uh, where I don't have that. And mm -hmm. then, of course, it can always go up and up. I mean, especially Americans, man, I think we just keep raising the bar once we get to certain levels. But for some people that do want to, like Kevin's even saying, like Marco's currently doing, when you're just focused on your little piece of land and you're just trying to raise bees and chickens and, and rabbits and, and improve that little spot, that, especially back in the day, that was the American dream. It was a closed loop system because that's how it worked. Your forefather built the house. You probably your father was there raising you in there. And then eventually you are going to be able to take that over. And you would continue to build out and have like an in-law suite and stuff but the cost of living for the average family has just gone through the roof where most people are struggling with one paying job so what we want as a community is for you guys to figure out that there's other ways to bring in income than just trading your time for money and i didn't learn that until i was probably at least 35 years old even though i'd read some of the books that kevin's even talking about when i was in college I even read out. I had to read Outlier when I was in my mid thirties to grasp the concept of ten thousand hours is a long time. But on the span of where my life is at this point, I mean, it's going to pass me by either way. So why not try to focus on some of this stuff and stop living? I mean, there were some nights, nice boys, where I was feeling a certain way about it. Like, man, I can't. I can barely afford ramen noodles and shit. Like, what kind of lifestyle is this? How did I let myself get to this point? Um, that you know, there's a lot of things in life, especially when you're younger where you just don't realize like the smallest little emergency thing or the car breaks down and now that little nest egg that you had is gone. So you need some kind of thing that's going to bring in income on a monthly basis. And it's a lot easier these days, in my opinion, with the e-commerce stuff. You can teach yourself how to build a website, I promise you. You can build something about it. You can hustle cannabis uh, you know, I wasn't all, I wasn't the best grower, but what I tried to do and focus on was to try to be the best networker because I did know people at that time in my community, especially going to some of the grow stores at the time where they just had the funky cheese. They had the blue dreams that just looked the part. So I was able to network myself and be better at that. So there's, there's always a way to, to, to find a little more money for yourself. Uh, and I see time and time again, when I see my friends, I want to catch up with them. Hey, how you doing? Oh, man, I, I just can't keep up. I'm, I'm in debt. I have all these things going on. It's like, OK, but in fairness, I also know that you play video games. And if you're feeling that way, then what the fuck, man? You're a grown ass man. And I hope that more people are kind of that way. Like sometimes you need tough love with people and sometimes you need tough love with growers. It's like. Some of those guys out there, it's, you know, when I was growing up in Atlanta, there'd be like these 35, 40 year old dudes that are talking about that they're going to be famous rappers. It's like, man, get realistic. That, sh that ship is sailed. If you're in your probably same thing, if you're in your late 30s, early 40s, you're probably not going to be a commercial grower. They don't want to pay you what you're worth. And you're not going to be you're not going to get the kind of the respect you feel like you probably need to ever make changes for the better. So just stay in your lane. And I think that's the biggest thing with these boys is the fact that they can just make their own inputs. The fact that this community has grown in the last five years from just a few people, some famous names teaching this stuff. to now you have 
basically Insta my Instagram feed, to be honest, is is big booties and a bunch of uh, IMOs and, and cannabis and that kind of stuff. I mean, the algorithm, it shows you what you look at, I guess. And the fact that there's so many people on IMO uh, train right now, it gives me uh, confidence that the shows like this on Future Cannabis Project and all these other podcasts that are popping up around the the world basically are dramatically making a difference in the cannabis space. A lot more people are talking about that this should be a medicine than they used to. And I think when they used to say medical marijuana, the average person that didn't smoke used to believe that that actually meant that it was medicinal. And now they realize behind the scenes, these dispensaries are the worst. You want to find somebody that's actually growing um, uh, for themselves and small batch, the, the people that apologize about being a small tent farmer, that's who you want to talk to because they care so much that they're actually apologizing that they're only running like six plants, 12 plants. That's where it's true medicine. And I hope more people see it that way. Yeah. All right. So I don't want to lose track of time. Uh, I feel like we've all had some fun rants about this, but I hope you know, we want people to find a, uh, yeah, we want people to find success. I mean, if you're constantly thinking about money, then you're not going to be able to put your mind on anything else. And that's a really sad thing in life. You want to yeah, be able don't to leave have with time. money. No yeah, you want to have time to be able to find these passions or, or pursue a passion. Right. So no, money quick, never ends. <laughs> yeah, you man. Know? I mean, there's. You'll chase that forever until you die. Where does it so, stop? Yeah. Just so chase, that, quick, chase that happiness and let's move on. Yep. Amen. <laughs> So to Gasoline Alley, real quick, I wanted to throw out, because uh, Kevin is an entrepreneur, takes care of his five children, uh, he's come out with three new genetics that are dropping uh, Friday, Black Friday. Friday. Yeah. So thir um, two days from now, he's got three femme genetics, uh, Juicy Lucy, The Remedy, and the, the Celtic, that's how they're right, Celtic Goddess. Celtic Goddess. Yeah, so so these let's, are, uh, let's run through those real quick. Yeah, so this is a shout out to... Uh, at Fatbeard Pothead, he is a he did a little collab with me on these. And if you go to at Fatbeard Pothead on Instagram, you'll be able to see him. He's got them going right now, growing in his grow. All three of them, you can see them all. They're in about week four or five of flower right now. Everybody looks good, but the the juicy Lucy is a blueberry passion. Let me look here real quick. Remember, blueberry passion. Yeah, blueberry uh, blueberry passion cross to peach dosi cross the bluetooth i don't give a lot of names like these these films that we made are almost to like i just want to breed these two plants together just to see what they do and move forward with them because he's growing with them right now i mean that's basically what you do with every plant it kind of sounds silly but i didn't take the time to really go through and name a whole lot of strains so or name a whole lot of the new creations. It's just like Bluetooth cross the peach dosi. So the names get really, really long in the lineage. But Juicy Lucy is one of them. She's going to have a good blueberry taste. These are all going to be pretty much on the fruity, fruity, gassy side. But Juicy Lucy with blueberry passion in her, she's going to have some blueberry smell. Uh, these are all fems. She's going to have blueberry terps. She's going to be fruity. You got Celtic, go Celtic goddess which was made from my blueberry guava and it has uh it has dolce de freeze in it and it's got my bluetooth in it but um we crossed yeah. blueberry guava to my peach dosi bluetooth strain and then the last one is the remedy remedy is blueberries and muffin else which is another one of my creations and it is really good blueberry and um fat beard he hunted he hunted some of the blueberries and muffin else out and he found two that he liked and we crossed those both of those blueberries and muffin else with my peach dosi bluetooth uh that was reversed and we created just some really good films and again if you go to at fat beard potheads page you're going to see them up right now you can look at them check them out ask him what they smell like right now and all that fun stuff but there's a black friday sale you'll get five films from all three strains it's um it's one what is it one fifteen, uh, Black Friday sale. Email me at okcalix at gmail dot com. Okcalix at gmail dot com. Another thing, shout out to uh, Kid Mac. He's been building on the website. He's been helping me out a whole lot. He's very really good guy. Both those guys are awesome. But Kid Mac has been working on all this like just 
uh, the business side of it, setting up a good website, setting up the Shopify with it, all PayPal, Cash Bow, Venmo accounts, everything, you know, a guy that knows how to do that stuff. Anyway, he is helping me do all that. So shout out to him. Go and check out okcalix.com. It's a web page. I just we, I just had him kind of – last night I was over at his house. I was like, let's get it up and going just so people can go check it out. But I have a few little things I need to adjust on there, but you guys will be kind of the first people that are listening to this YouTube show to go check out okcalix.com. You'll see some beautiful pictures of me holding my stuff like this. I love it. I love my pictures, dude. I've got I've got my IMO3, my compost, my IMO5, you know, just a just a really cool picture of me holding it in my hands above a big tote of it. And I really like the color. I, I like the way it looks. I like the scheme. I gotta fix a few things, but I'm excited. I like it. Go I told him I will go get it online. I want you I want you to go look at it. I like the colors. I like the softness of it. I like the just the natural welcoming of it. You can go click on the about and kind of read a little bit about OK Calix Organics. So it's fun. Check that out. Nice, nice, nice. Blueberry. So the remedy, the remedy is gonna be the most blueberry, you you think? Yeah, that blueberry is a muffin else. It's it's legit yummy blueberry. Yeah, fantastic cool. stuff. Nice. Juicy Lucy Celtic Goddess and Remedy. So a little collab with him. That'll be a Black Friday sale. And then again, the um at Fatbeard Pothead is his Instagram. There's also um you know, the belief collab still going on, still working on it. It just takes time. we got to grow out the plants. Shout out to uh, at Scissor Tell Solventless. Uh, Warren's the man up there. He is an entrepreneur. He's a heck of a guy. He works hard all the time, but I'm going to be doing a lot of breeding up there at his, uh, at, at his grow. I do not own any of it. He's the man. He is letting me come in, and we're going to do a little bit of breeding, create some new strains for his facility. We want washers that are good and fruity with a little bit of gas behind it just to push that fruity smell. And then eventually we'll move on into some other fun terps. But shout out to those three guys, at Fatbeard Pothead, at Kid Mac, and at Scissor Tail Savalas. Good guys that I'm working with right now. Fun little team we've got going on. Right on. Uh, we're going to – we got a, a few questions here, so I wanted to run through these and respect your time and Marco's time. And ahead, in a way, right? respect my own time. Um <laughs> Yeah, so uh, OE1 Colnobi, uh, can I make IMO3 without OHN? Would it be worth it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to use any certain, well, in my world, let me, here's my advice. You don't have to use any certain input for Mother Nature to do what she's already going to do. If you want to go with the KNF recipe or somebody who has a KNF recipe and you want to follow a, a recipe, then OHN is probably going to be on that recipe. But you do not have to, it's not required for Mother Nature to trigger everything, right? You don't have to have it. Really, Marco. you just need some good inoculated oh, material mm -hmm. and some nice. moisture. And that's what, that's going to set everything off. Like if you want to get down to the bare things of what you need, put all that organic material that I collected, put it in a tote with a little bit of just wet moisture in there and some heat, it's over. But those other things just help help create a nutrient-dense material, and it does kind of help set it off a little faster. Yeah, I agree. I, mean, that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's recipes. If you want to follow a recipe, there's, like he said, there's a with it, OHN. I use it if I have it. Um, I use it if I think about it, you know, but it's not vital. And I think earlier what we were getting at, to be fair, is sometimes people, the first time they do it, they're already like, oh, I know I can improve this little speck or whatever the recipe is. I'm going to use this technique or use this ingredient instead. And what we're saying is from a from a standpoint, it's better to replicate, find success, see that you can do these kind of things and then experiment with this. And I think some there's a there's a certain percentage, in my opinion, the try out KNF, the try even making OHN, which is kind of a hard thing to do, FAAs, that kind of stuff that's a process. They don't find success in it, and then secretly they badmouth it like it doesn't work when it was more operator error than obviously. Uh, and now I'm proud to see that there's so many people doing it. It's pretty hard to uh, say that it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, OHN is one. Definitely learn your, your learn OHN and make it and use it for yourself. Eh? If nothing else, for yourself, you know. 
That, it was that's a process. Kinda, too. So how it worked with me was I looked at K and F and I was like, ooh, I got to get in. If, if I want to do organic growing, I have to do what's called K and F. That was a mindset I had for a time. And, you know, I got into reading all about KNF and started realizing, man, there is a lot of measurement. There's a lot of detail. And that's just not the kind of mindset that I have. And so I, the, after that, I was kind of like, well, let's check out this Jadam thing. And I was like, Jadam's where it's at, man. That's easy. Just throw it all over there and wait a minute and then go use it again. And so then mm -hmm. I got into Jadam. And like you're saying, uh, Brian, I kind of found some confidence. I found a system that worked for me. And then I kind of backtracked into KNF. And kind of picked and choose what I wanted to use from KNF in my in the Jadam methods. And the the IMO one through five was definitely something that I took and used because I want to make good soil. But I didn't really take a lot of the the nutrient side of it. I just stuck with the JLF and the JMS because it was just so much easier and it works well in my system. So yeah, I did find some confidence in JM or did find confidence in Jadam and then Went in, went back into K and F to learn a little bit that kind of benefited me. Instead of trying to learn the whole K and F process of everything, there's a lot to learn. If you want to try to get into it, there is a lot of things that you can try to master and conquer. And uh, I just didn't have that kind of time in my. And I don't think I have the ability to stop and read and measure. I'm too go go go. You you'll learn it all over time and then and then over time you'll just go water only so you know it's all good <laughs> you know what i'm saying you're gonna learn all this shit, and the ultimate goal you're just going to go in water only. boom fungal fungal so um, yeah ultimately if you make good soil all you need is the water that's it it's over if you got good soil anything gonna grow in that good soil uh cody wants to know what about maple syrup when we were talking about all the different sugars I like that on my pancakes. I was I would not waste maple syrup on IMO ever. I would be eating maple syrup on my food. Thank you. Now I know there's a byproduct. A friend of mine makes maple syrup and they have this some byproduct. And I'd say, yeah, use that, you know, compost or whatever. If you're gonna just toss that anyway. But yeah, the syrup, no, that's that's good stuff. I'm you know, the syrup, if you're if you're asking, can I make IMO two with with syrup, I would think that the water content is syrup is so high that it's just not going to work real well. I think it needs to be more sugary than watery. But that, that I don't know. Again, maple syrup, that's good stuff. Man, I went to Vermont last year with my wife at about this time, a little bit earlier in October, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful place. And we went and saw all how they make those, how they make the maple uh, syrup. And there were just maple trees with lines running from the another one to another one all the way down a hill all the way into this little processing plant anyway it's fantastic yeah i was out looking at my now's a good time if you got a little bit of property maples will show so i was able to i found a little maple uh, about 15 foot foot tall that was back in the canopy of the forest but now it's shining so now i'm going to clear out some trees around it just to kind of let it be more of a focal point All right. I want to, it's not really, I guess, a question, but I wanted your thoughts on this. Um, you know, in the early days, people are growing these, like, uh, the, the main, the famous one was build a soils, like 12 seed blend cover crop uh, for people that were on the go and busy or at the commercial level. These, this 12 different seed cover crop was really just too much to manage. It, it, all of a sudden you were supposed to be money that you were saving. You're now having your team cut down all of this cover crop chopping and dropping so the the cost savings went away people have now some of them are moving into the grasses to keep things easier to keep things lower and then i've seen on kind of a smaller scale people are talking about the chia seeds because it is a lot easier to grow these are the things that you know when we were younger on the late night tv when you would grow things for easter and stuff those were chia seeds that were growing out of those clay figurines and stuff so people have been more using this. I've seen it on the forums and stuff. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on chia seeds? I know there's tons of protein. There's tons of obviously vitamins and nutrients within this little seed. I've never grown. I think I grew a chia pet one time when I was a little kid. But I've never used any chia seed thus far. That I'm aware of anyway. Marco, you? Nah, we had the chia, we had the chia pet 
<laughs> when I was a kid too, and uh, it didn't really, fu- it didn't really fully grow out like the commercial. So I, I never went back to chia seeds. But hey, man, I tr- toss them in there. If they grow and they work for you, share it. Let us know. You know what I mean? Yeah, interesting thoughts. Um, from Lucas Non, do you guys break up the chunks before applying to soil or leaf hole? Well, I spread it. I, I like to break up and sprinkle it out evenly. Um, chunks, if you, you know, you just drop a big chunk right here, that whatever was in that chunk could have spread out and inoculated a lot more of your soil. So I like to break chunks up when I spread. Yeah, I agree. You're trying to, you're trying to, you know, if we're talking about IMO3, I'm going to be breaking it up anyway a little bit because I'm going to be mixing it in with some compost. And then when that IMO4 is made and it's lots of fungal networks, I'm going to be breaking it up anyway because I got to put it in a soil or I got to put it in a pot or whatever I'm going to do with it. So the I think the goal is to get the fungal chains growing, get them going, and then you're going to have to break them up some because you got to, you just got to use it. But those fungal pieces, that they're going to keep on going. They'll be fine. So... The, the point, the bigger point is, is you're not, you don't care if you've got a tote full of IMO4, it's like, that's not the point. The point is for the IMO4 to be in the soil or on the ground. And you're wanting, that's where you want it because then it's going to start creating the fungal chains that you want. It's going to help with that. So use it again as a, use those chunks as messengers, use them as senders, get it, get it spread out, go ahead and break them up and get it everywhere. And then they'll start multiplying in the place you left it. What well, well, people people would hit me up with, man, I got I got ordered your IMO three. How should I use it? Like, I'm like, use it, you know, spread it out, build more soil. But the worst thing you can do is to have it on the shelf because if you're sitting on if it's sitting on the shelf, it's not working for you. And I know it's counter. Can't, it seems like cannabis folks love just saving something, right? Always keeping something, but. Even if you take that bag and just put it in a bag of regular Joe soil, at least now you got more micro, you know, more, you're getting more out of it, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, Mike, I'll tell you what I did whenever you sent me, <clears throat> what was it? I think it was just fermented wheat bran or something like that, but it came in a, it came in a gunny sack. Uh, yeah, gunny sack kind of a thing, a small one. Anyway, I just, I didn't, I wasn't going to use it at the time because of the time of the year. And so what I did was I put the whole sack in my compost and I just let it sit there. And of course the compost ate the gunny sack, you know, but in springtime, I just kind of peeled that gunny sack away and scooped out your stuff and went ahead and used it. But it was, it was going to work in my compost at least, you know, there was something happening instead of sitting on a shelf. Uh Um. For out, you know, out in the woods, I guess, when you're trying to use things that are locally around you, what are your thoughts about deer or other wild animal frass? I find piles throughout my pasture. Yeah, so whenever I'm out collecting IMO3, poo-poo is one of the things I collect. Deer, uh, rabbit, you'll see big old uh, blue heron cranes taking a dump on a log somewhere. It's just loaded with white manure, you know. I've grabbed all kinds of manures. I don't use, like I said, I don't use like like um, domesticated large animals, farm animals. But like a deer out in the woods, no problem. You know, rabbits, armadillos, all that stuff is very useful. It's loaded with nutrients, loaded with microbiology. That is the point of what we do. A little different for me because um, I have rabbits and certain at wild, like wild rabbits, their poop they carry a parasite that can get into your domesticated uh, rabbits. Um, and then raccoon poop has uh, is very known for, uh, for lots of round worms, which you don't want like raccoon poop around your other smaller animals too. So that's relative to what you got going on. You know, I know that because I'm working with those animals. And um, so I just want to throw that out there. Just figure out what you got, whose poop it is and you know what you're doing with it is key. Here's from uh, Hillbilly Herb. Went to turn my compost like we last week, and it's full of tree roots. Don't want to break contact with ground, but I need a comp. But I would imagine. But do I need a concrete pad or something? Nah, roots are part of it, man. I've got roots in. Whenever I dig my compost bins, 
Um, when I dig all the way to the bottom, I got roots all over the place. I don't have tree. I don't have trees very close to here at all, but there are big root trees that have made their way to my compost. Um, and all you got to do is just, you know, you just d take a take that pitchfork and just rake and rake and rake. And you know, the way I think about it is this: it's either I'm going to try to cut all those roots out. And that's going to be a lot of work, or I'm going to understand that those roots are probably putting out a lot of exudates, attracting a lot of microbiology, and it's not that big a deal. Get over it and just move past it and learn that it's probably beneficial for those roots to be in there. And when it's time to come and dig the compost out, just dig the compost out and leave the root or cut them back and start all over. Yeah, I got a little, I got 100 gallon uh, worm bin um, in, in my basement that I inoculate all my different isopod bins with. And because I use the avocado tech every now and then, the avocado will spring up uh, sometimes like two feet high. We'll obviously have uh, leaves for maybe a couple of months, but for whatever reason, probably because it's in the basement and I'm not paying to uh, put electricity on it, it, it dies off. But I've noticed because I then have grown the leaves out and the roots are gone, that for whatever reason, it is a catalyst for these compost, the red wiggler, especially composting worms, to take off. Like I just see all the little tiny white ones that you normally see when things are just thriving around that root system. So I let it grow specifically for that, knowing that it's, I guess, in hindsight, kind of a waste of time unless you understand, you understand why you're growing it from a soil aspect. I know that it's not going to ever produce an avocado for me, right? That would take forever. But the fact that I can just grow it out and eventually let it die off seems to be extremely beneficial, even in a dark basement. That's a gold bar right there. Because we always talk about the value of plant root and soil. So, yeah, definitely. Encourage that kind of shit. Even if you don't have the light, you might benefit from just sprinkling a low cover crop down there, Brian. Let it germinate, kind of germinate, and then we'll fizzle back right back into the soil just to kind of change up the chemistry a little bit on that. Yeah. I bought uh, like 1500 worms, I don't know, four or five years ago and I've never had to buy them again. So I mean, that's what we're kind of talking about. And I live in the most city. I mean, it's, I, it's I'm not proud of it or anything, but there's a zero scape policy even in my neighborhood. So the fact that I can still get my hands dirty and have, you know, dirt and grime underneath my, my fingernails, it feels good to at least be able to touch that. And the, there's something to always having a worm bin, knowing that you know, if worst case scenario, I got something to inoculate and, and kind of build from the best. All right. Uh, last two, we could do rapid fire real quick here. Do you guys know of anyone doing a living floor for pigs, horses, cows in mainland USA? Shout out to MI Beneficials, dude. Has amazing healthy bugs. Co-sign that. Yeah, he does. Well, I mean, you know, really, do I know anyone doing living floor for pigs, horses, cows? Great. I mean, there's natural you know, farmer. Like, why? Like yeah, locally natural with, farmer. Why? Locally, with me, there's lots of guys on farms out here that are now spraying labs all over the place and trying to make some bokashi out of some kind of organic material and then getting it onto their onto their you know, the, the areas where the animals are. So, it, yeah, in that sense, yeah, people are definitely trying to get some type of living floor going for different types of animals that bed down. Um, it's not, you know, it's not just published as living soil floors. It's what they're doing is a living soil floor, right? What the, all the stuff that they're applying. I mean, Candy Natural Farming, he does that stuff. He'll spray labs. Uh, he'll spray fish amino acid all over. You know, whereas cattle come into a barn and they lay down on the hay bedding and stuff, just spraying that all over. That I mean, that's just a living, that's a living soil practice for sure. But yeah, shout out to MI Beneficials. Dude definitely got some amazing bugs. He's yes, he does. He's a buggy man. Do you have anything uh, to add to that? I mean, you basically are doing that with your chickens and your rabbits. So I would imagine, um, you know, with pigs, it's probably a little more disgusting well, pigs is where it where it started you know what i mean like uh, drake with natural farm in hawaii is doing living floor uh pig pens and they don't smell so if it stinks out there they're not doing living floor you know what i mean and i can attest to that even just a few animals i have like the living floor really takes that smell away you know what i mean and 
I'm sure for like, you know, pigs, yeah, you can do smaller pens. Cows, probably a little bit more difficult um, just because of the size of the animal. You know, cows roaming way outside and way, you know, coming back in type of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, people are kind of getting into it, but um, just me doing it on my chickens, I'm trying to show people this. That's kind of the way to do it. Uh, for another question from Stone Mason. Marco, do you ferment your chicken feed a day before giving it to them? I do sometimes. I'll go ahead and soak it and toss in a little bit of LAB, something like that. Or if I make lab, I'll just throw the curds in there. Um, I don't ferment it every day. I got them on a dry, um, I got them on um, this organic layer feed with olive oil. And um, so I just feed them that dry. But um, Man, they get plenty of fermented foods and um, scraps, so it's 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 definitely valuable for them. Right on. Well, uh, that was the last question. Uh, appreciate your time as always, Kevin. Uh, for you guys that yes. ha haven't heard of him before, he's on the show several times now for a reason. Uh, his Instagram is well informative. Mm -hmm. You can learn from Marco and Kevin. Uh, there's a lot of things that they do you know, kind of in the same lane, same vision. But what I also like about this, and I was excited to have this conversation again, is that they also believe in different ways to do certain things. So you can follow two Michelin chefs while you're a sous chef and eventually get to the level where when you open your own restaurant, you know the, the approach that you want to go after. And you have these recipes kind of dialed mm -hmm. in as your own recipes because you know that you can repeat the process so that you played around kind of with your own stuff locally. Maybe some stuff that you found where, hey, I can make more money doing it this way, save more money doing it that way. There's just so many. Uh, it's almost like empowering, if you will, once you start to understand the soil systems, because there's other ways to do things to either cut costs or find ways to monetize. Uh, and I, I love that aspect of using Mother Nature and, and finding ways to just be a little bit better than the competition because you're continuing to educate yourself while making these living uh, products. So I wanted to, again, give you a, a moment to highlight everything, Kevin. I know that, you know, the, the genetics are important, obviously. So uh, get those fems out there for people that want to support Kevin. Uh, you know, the, if you've never seen his Instagram, the support is there from the community. Same thing with Marco. Uh, and even in my little world, you know, there's the support with isopods. So cannabis has continued to grow. And these two gentlemen are influencers. And I, I you know, that word is kind of silly. But in this uh, aspect, I, I want to use it, uh, you know, on purpose, because influencing, if you're really talking about that, then it means that you're influencing others to do something. And the fact that we're influencing others to be positive about things, to find other ways to monetize these two gentlemen have kind of changed the game from IMOs from just one kind of viewpoint back in the day to now several viewpoints. And as these things progress, it'll be hundreds of viewpoints and then eventually thousands of viewpoints of people figuring out how to do this and, and just adding their own little spin. So we appreciate your time, Kevin, today. Thank you, yeah, man. I'm thankful that you guys let me come on here. Brian and Marco, it's always a joy to be with you. And everybody watching, I appreciate you guys. And if you listen to me, I want you to have a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Your mental health is something we don't talk about a whole lot. But golly, it's so big and important, to, I think, to all three of us. And being a, being a thankful person, being a person who says, man, I appreciate what you've done for me. <laughs> that makes you a happier person. So be thankful, man. Tell somebody thank you. If your parents are still living, tell them I appreciate you being a good parent. If they weren't a good parent, find somebody to say, I appreciate you, because being a thankful person is going to help you. So out of all that talking we did, you are important. Your mind is important, and I want you to be thankful. I want you to have help, man. I want you to have mental health. So it's always on my mind. <clears throat> but, guys, I really appreciate you letting me come and chat with you guys. Yes, man. Good fun. Great conversation, man. Fun point. See, seeing all kinds of different aspects and points of view, and I know somebody's going to take something you shared today and run with it as, as we hope they do i love the ingredients you got stocked up i say i like to say that's uh, microbes already built in you are loaded and ready to roll so uh next rainy day i know you're going to be knocking out something uh yeah. on those microbes so appreciate you man thank you yeah. thank y'all thanks marco yeah go go support these guys <laughs> Uh, Black Friday is obviously big for all uh, small businesses. So the more that you guys can help 
uh, everybody that's involved in Future Cannabis Project. Go on to Daga as well. Uh, check out those seeds from Peter. Check out uh, from Mark MI Beneficials. Uh, once a year, Rubber Duckies offers 50% off our pricing. Uh, we feel like we have industry-leading pricing, so the fact that we're offering 50%, I haven't really seen anybody else offering that. So we appreciate the customers. We appreciate the reviews. All of that stuff matters more than you think uh, when, you're, when you're trying to build a brand. And So uh, thank you again for everybody that has supported us in 2023. Uh, we look forward to 2024, where we will have over 100 different isopod species continuously uh, being offered into the marketplace. Any last words, Marco, or anything? Uh, We'll see you guys next week. Yeah, sounds good. Peace. Appreciate y'all.